Hello everyone and welcome to our very first service for Sun Meadow Temple. So I know today is going to be a little different. I know our original service plan includes a lot of things like songs and opening and closing words and such, but uh, this one is very much going to uh, test a lot of the technological elements and aspects of this. So it might not work perfectly the first time and we don't want anyone to miss anything, so we're going to be doing it this way. So I assume y'all can see the fabulous slideshow that I am sharing with you. Yes? No? You, you can put it in chat, or... Still working, right guys? Yes, perfect. Okay, that's exactly what it should say. This is our first service. Say, so for this month, the monthly theme that I have picked is Chaos and Order. So, for this theme, we're going to be talking about, um, well, just, you know, order in a world and think, controlling the things that you can and can't control. Um, I did only have two days to prepare this service, uh, <laughs> and so this is going to be a very short one, and as it's a test service, we are going to be doing a lot of things a little differently. Um, so, this is our theme introduction. I promise we'll work on it and we'll get better, and it will be better next time when I have two weeks instead of two days to write the service. So to start with, Lots of people, when they think of chaos, you know, think of complete disorganization and just not being able, no, not that, just not having any control in your life. And that is obviously something that's very concerning and some people and many people struggle with. And so there have been lots and lots of people, religious and otherwise, who have talked about having control and chaos and exercising and giving up control over what you can. And so that's what we'll be talking about this month. So, uh, to, for our next thing, we're going to start with our myth or reading for this month, which is... Early Greek Philosophy by John Burnett. And this specific reading is by Empedocles. I shall tell thee a twofold tale. At one time it grew to be one only out of many. At another it divided up to be many instead of one. There is a double, the coming of perishable things and a double passing away. The coming together of all things brings one generation into being and destroys it. The other grows up and is scattered as things become divided. And these things never cease continually, changing places at one time, all uniting in one through love, at another each born in different directions by the repulsion of strife. Thus, as far as it is their nature to grow into one out of many, and to become many once more when the one is parted asunder, so far they come into being, and their life abides not, but inasmuch as they never cease changing their places continually. So far they are ever immovable as they go round the circle of existence. But come, hearken to my words, for it is learning that increaseth wisdom. As I've said before, when I declared the heads of my discourse, I shall tell thee a twofold tale. At one time it grew together to be one only out of many, at another it parted asunder, so as to be many instead of one. Fire and water and earth and the mighty height of air, dread strife too, apart from these, of equal weight to each, and love among them, equal in length and breadth. Her do thou contemplate with thy mind, nor sit with dazed eyes, it is she that is known as being implanted in the frame of mortals. 
It is she that makes them have thoughts of love and work, the works of peace. They call her by the names of Joy and Aphrodite. Her has no mortal yet marked moving round the round among them, but do thou attend to the undeceitful ordering of my discourse? For all these are equal and alike in age, yet each has a different prerogative and its own peculiar nature, and nothing comes into being besides these, nor do they pass away, for if they had been passing away continually, they would not be now, and what could increase all and whence it come? How, too, could it perish, since no place is empty of these things? They are what they are, but running through one another, they become now this, now that, and like things evermore. Love, clinging love. This, the contest of love and strife, is manifest in the mass of mortal limbs. At one time all the limbs that are the body's portion are brought together by love in blooming life's high season. At another, severed by cruel strife, they wander each alone by the breakers of life's sea. It is the same with plants and the fish that make their homes in the waters, with the beasts that have their lairs on the hills and the seabirds that sail on wings. Come now, look at the things that bear witness to my earlier discourse. If so be that there was any shortcoming as to their form in the earlier list, behold the sun, everywhere bright and warm, and all the immortal things that are bathed in heat and bright radiance. Behold the rain, everywhere dark and cold, and from the earth issue forth things close-pressed and solid. When they are in strife, all these are different in form and separated, but they come together in love and are desired by one another. For out of these have sprung all things that were and are and shall be, trees and men and women, beasts and birds and the fishes that dwell in the waters, yea, and the gods that live long lives and are exalted in honor. For these things are what they are, but running through one another they take different shapes. So much does mixture change them. For all of these, sun, sky, earth, and sea, are one with their parts that are cast far and wide from them in mortal things, and even so all things that are more adapted for mixture are like to one another and united in love by Aphrodite. Those things again that differ most in origin mixture and the forms imprinted on each are most hostile, being together unaccustomed to unite and very sorry by the bidding of strife since it hath wrought their birth. Just as when painters are elaborating temple offerings, men whom wisdom hath well taught their art, they, when they have taken pigments of many colors on their hands, mix them in due proportion, more of some and less of others, and from them produce shapes like unto all things, making trees and men and women, beasts and birds and fishes that dwell in the waters, yea, and gods that live long lives, and are exalted in honor, so let not the error prevail over thy mind. That there is any other source of all perishable creatures that appear in countless numbers, know this for sure. For thou hast heard the tale from a goddess. Stepping from summit to summit, not to travel only one path to the end, what is right may well be even said twice, for they prevail in turn as the circle comes round, and pass into one another, and grow great in their appointed turn. They are what they are, but running through one another, they become men and tribes of beasts. At one time they are all brought together by love, at another they are carried in different directions by the repulsion of strife, till they grow once more into one, and are wholly subdued. Thus, in so far as they are wont to grow into one out of many, and again divided, become more than one, so far they come into being, and their life is not lasting, but in so far as they never cease changing continually, so far are they evermore immovable in the circle. Oh.
Okay, so that was going to be all for our first one. I planned for it only to be about 10 minutes, as it was super short, and I did not have a ton of time to work on it. I had like four hours, so um, it wasn't perfect, I will say. I am super eager to hear all of your thoughts. You can put them in general, or you should be able to talk. I don't think I have talking turned off, but let me see. If not, if you can't talk or figure it out, ah, yes, and say something. Why is this not working? I knew we were going to have some te technical issues. Okay, it should work now. Did it work? Try talking. I'll try talking. Nope, okay. technically helpful today. <laughs> okay, there we go. Okay, minimal technical issues is good. <laughs> okay, I promise next time these will be a lot longer. I've got other books and things, but I just, I had like three hours today and was not in the fastest. Okay. So, yes. It seems like everything is working well technically, and I swear the one that's in two weeks will be much better than this, but that was all I had planned for today. Promise, next time we're going to have a lot more fun, we're going to quote Camus, it'll be great. This was mainly a test reading. Could everyone constantly hear the reading, is my question. You can put it in chat, or just in general. Or just raise your hand to speak. I've got, hopefully, requests to speak. Oh, perfect! Oh, lovely. Lovely, lovely chat. Perfect. Okay, so what did you guys think? I can hear you, I can see you now in chat. What did you guys think? Any, you know, questions or anything? So, you no, know, it was a really short, it was only planned to be like 10 minutes for today. Yes, I, your general themes. That's why I picked a Greek reading rather than rather than another one because lots of Greek people talk about chaos. I'm aware you say, yeah. So I know at some point they'll be more applicable. For next one, we're going to be talking a little more about probably we're going to stick with Greek. We might we might do some Egyptian um, for the next one, but we're going to you know talk about Camus. And a lot of these services are generally based on themes about why we chose this and what people struggle with and, you know, a way to connect spiritually to each other. And it'll be, I promise it'll be better when we have the um, opening and closing words and the songs once I figure out how to make them work and rewrite them. So it'll be, there'll be a lot more involved in this when we get to that point. So again, this was very much a short test one where I planned for it to only be like 10 to 15 minutes. It was very short, let's say. And thank you. Okay, yes, I'm going to always explain why I chose the reading and what I like it, and I'm always going to put, like, who the reading is by and where I got it from. That will always be something you can have, and if I don't do that, please yell at me. Okay, so that was all. Any, are there any other comments, concerns, anything else anyone wants to discuss? In the future, I will be sitting with the laptop facing that bookshelf and area that I showed you, and you will be able to see, um, hopefully, the books, and my chair will be over there, and there'll be the sign, and we'll be able to see all the books and have all the, the discussions. Yes, please, I would, that is literally your job as a council member to do that, so that is exactly what I want. Um, yeah, for the, in the future, there'll be more books and readings, and there'll be a lot more other stuff. So, is that good for everyone? I would love, I would love to hear your views. Like, put, like, 10 out of 10 in the thing, or, like, 4 out of 10 if you think I really did bad. Whichever you want, because this is my first time doing this, and we're working out lots of... I've spent an hour before this working out technology kinks. Perfect. 7 out of 10. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Didn't expect to be perfect the first time. 8 out of 10. Excellent. Okay. I swear these will get much, much, much better when I have more time to prep everything. 
to have everything set. Um, so yeah, that was all I had for today. Uh, typically we have in our schedule a coffee hour after this, so I can just have everyone talk and I will have the and I will end the recording, um, or we can do something else. Or you can all leave and not hang out. You know, it works up to you. Which do you guys prefer? I'll explain more, I guess, in the coffee hour of what my future plans are and everything. And okay, nice to have you here. I was very happy you joined. You can leave now, Belle. Let's see. So I'm going to kick the recording and we can all just chat now. Hey! Hello everyone and welcome to everyone and welcome to our second observance. Uh, I'm so happy to have all of you here. Let me open my script for a second on my phone, just a tad behind. Okay. So, good evening or good afternoon, whatever time it is to you, and welcome to Sun Meadow Temple. Uh, we are so happy you've joined us today. My name is Alba, and I use she, her pronouns. As most of you know, this is our second service, and we are so grateful uh, to have been able to reach this place. As always, this service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Before we begin today, I will let you know that our first service has been removed from the channel due to a variety of audio issues. Uh, thank you to the members who have alerted me to those. I will be re-recording uh, certain parts and re-uploading them, and they will be up before our next service. Uh, I am also here to let you know uh, that uh, our website issues are being worked on and updated. So everything should be going well with that. Um, hopefully they will get back to me. If not, we will migrate hosts. Um, as for the uh, physical vi film of me presenting, uh, some of the background is not done yet and we're still working on that. So today it will be just like the previous service and we'll be doing it only online um, with our fabulous slideshow. So I hope that works for everyone. So today we are going to open with our new opening words, uh, which are on this next slide here. Uh, you are welcome to read these along at home or just listen as I read them out loud. Okay. So, we welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith cherishing love, and with open hearts. In the future, when I am on, on film, we will have a camera and a physical candle to light. Uh, I'm sorry we're still working on that for everyone. It's just been a little bit chaotic. <laughs> okay, so our theme this month has been order and chaos, which is the foundation of multiple uh, pagan faiths. In many paths, chaos and order are opposites as well as companions, and chaos is often the foundation of religious beliefs and sentiments. Our readings today are from Theogony by Hesiod, translated by Charles Abraham Elton, and Gods and Heroes by Ferdinand Schmidt and Carl Friedrich Becker, translated by George P. Upton. First of all beings, chaos was, and next, wide-bosomed earth, the seat forever firm, of all the mortals whose abode is placed, among the Mount Olympus snow-topped heads, or in the dark abysses of the ground. Then love most beauteous of immortals rose, he of each god and immortal man at once, Unnerve the limbs, dissolves the wiser beast, by reason steeled and quells the very soul. And then on to our next reading, which is a lot longer. He see it was the short one. It's the story of Sisyphus. Sisyphus was in the same dreadful place. In the upper world, he had been guilty of thefts among men and the gods. In the very hour of his death, 
per perpetrated an evil deed. He seized and bound Thanatos, the god of death, with brazen bands, and for a long time, no one on died on earth. The gods of the underworld sent to Zeus this message. Behold, Thanatos, who went to the upper world to bring Sisyphus here, has not returned. For several days no shade has entered our dark kingdom. Thereupon Zeus sent for the powerful war god Ares, and ordered him to find the god of death. He soon found and released him from his fetters, and Sisyphus was taken to the underworld by Thanatos. Even then he continued his deceitful deeds. He said to his wife, Do not bury my body, and make the customary death offering to the gods of the underworld. Then he appeared before Hades and Persephone and said, My wife has not buried my body and has neglected to make the death offering. Let me go to her and remind the faithless one of her duty. Then I surely will return. His wish was granted, and he returned to the upper world. As he did not come back, word was again sent to Zeus, who dispatched the swift-flying Hermes to take the deceiver back. When Sisyphus saw the divine messenger, his courage gave way, for he knew that mo no mortal could outdo him in cunning. Hermes took him back to the Dark Kingdom, where a fearful penalty awaited him. He had to roll up a huge block of marble up a high mountain, which no sooner reached the top than it went thundering down. He had to begin his task over and over, with sweat of toil and anguish dropping from his brow to the earth. Both chematism and heathenry have similar concepts as, this, as the Hellenistic viewpoints of chaos and order. Within chematism, there is a god called Epep, who was the embodiment of chaos and in opposition to Ma'at, who embodies order and truth. Epep was given the title of Enemy of Ra for their battles. Epep is commonly believed to have emerged alongside Ra from the waters of Nu, which you can see the depiction there on the upper right hand corner of the slide that was there at the beginning of the universe. Nu is the chaotic waters that all life and all of the world originates from. And in and are the primeval chaoses of the ocean, in this case rather than a void in Hellenism. In heathenry, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say these words, so we're going to go with what I assume is the best pronunciation. I assume you will correct me if I totally butcher it. The Jotnar uh, are in opposition <laughs> to the <laughs> Asir. The... Okay, so Jotnar? Okay, the Yotna are, are in opposition to the Asir. They are the gods of human society and represent order, and the Yotna represent the gods of nature and the wild. Commonly, the Asir are attributed to life and the next realm, while the Yotna are attributed to causes of death. Many people prayed to Thor to kill the Yotna who was attacking people with disease, and thus he became the guardian of humanity. There is also a concept of chaos being bet the void between and around realms. This is similar to the Greek etymology of the word, which originally meant void. Chaos as a deity in Hellenism was the original void from which all life emerged. In heathenry, here we go with another word I'm not going to be able to say. Uh, Ginnungabba. How'd I do? <laughs> okay. Is the void between and around realms, and the birthplace of the Jotnar. 
Yggdrasil, in this case, represent order, as it is holding the universe together and preventing the spread of the void. In all of these belief systems, chaos is the foundation of the world, and human gods provide order. Uh, as you can see on our slide, in the center is a depiction of the Hellenistic view of chaos, and to the left is a drawing of Yggdrasil, the world tree. Centuries of philosophers and religious texts have explored the relationship between chaos and order. Albert Camus discussed the quest of finding order uh, in life and the ability, inability to find it in the chaos of the universe. And Sisyphus is the perfect example of Camus' philosophy of searching for meaning in a chaotic universe because he knows his fate and his days are in order at all times. The Roman poet and philosopher Lucretius explains that atoms exist within the void of chaos uh, back 75 years uh, before the Common Era, or about 2,000 years ago. In this, chaos and order have always been parts of religious and philosophical life. You cannot have chaos without order, light without dark. The importance is always balance. Accepting the thing you cannot control while also applying order and process. Chaos is not inherently evil. It can be good or bad, and order is the same. Clinging to control is stressful and never successful. Leaving things entirely to chance can leave you without the ability to make choices. You should always question your beliefs and challenge their origins. Don't just accept something because it is told and it is the set order of the world. And just because there is a set order does not mean you need to follow it. Chaos can be a force for change and should not be resisted. But living entirely in chaos is stressful as you are without a safeguard. Balance the order you choose with the chaos of the world. Live within the gray rather than the black and the white. Chaos and order balance each other out and only together can they make a successful life. Okay, normally there would be a song here, but as we are still working on that and the songs committee, um, there will not be one today. There has been, there would have been a couple songs throughout this, but they are just not ready yet to be used. Um, so we will definitely work on that, and that will definitely extend the services by a couple of minutes. Okay. For now, we shall move on to the ritual portion of the service, which um, will be much longer and much more in detail when we are able to do the recording. For today, it will be just like the opening words, where you can read aloud or listen to me uh, read the ritual. As the background is still under construction, once that is fixed, uh, this will definitely improve. So these are the ritual words. You are welcome to read aloud or to, do, uh, to listen and say prayers silently to the gods or just meditate as you go. We leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We give this water to accept the flow of our lives. We give this rock to symbolize the stability of the gods in our world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. And our next part will be the final closing words. Um, which will also appear on the screen in front of you in just a second. As for you, always, you are welcome to read these aloud, just listen, or participate in another way. As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. 
Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. And now we shall have our usual coffee hour. Allow me to turn off the recording so everyone can feel comfortable speaking. Everyone and welcome to our second Excellent. So, good evening or good afternoon or good morning, depending on wherever you are, and welcome to Sun Metal Temple and a happy Pride Month to everyone. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba and I use she, her pronouns. Uh, this is our sir third service and I'm so happy to have you here. As always, this service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. So I'm sure you guys have been keeping up to date with the updates on our website, uh, and if you have not seen, I have the host for our original website has completely gone offline and gone down. So I have we have a new website set up. Uh, the link is in the announcements. The link is in announcements. So, as per usual, we will open today with our opening words, and they will appear on the screen behind you. And do you please read along at home, um, or just listen as I read them. into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration may its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world may you join us in this community of faith cherishing love and with open hearts so our theme for the month of june is kindness which has been foundational in many of the revival of pagan faiths especially considering Many of them revived alongside um, civil rights movements, uh, gay rights movements, and women's rights movements. Many ancient uh, faiths also focused on kindness through ethics and other societal expectations. So today we'll jump right into our readings because I do apologize, they are way longer than I anticipated today. Um, so we are reading from the Iliad and I'm going to butcher this, even though I was trying to help. The Havamal. So our... F Ooh, here we go. So our first... Oops, forgot to switch to the kindness slide. Sorry, my bad. So our first reading is this one from uh, Mr. Buckley. And so it begins... Uh, this is in the middle of a battle after a speech given by the Trojans. But Glaucus, son of Hippolochus, and son of Tydeus, met in the midst of both armies, eager to fight. But when they were near, going against each other, Diomede, brave in the din of war, first addressed him. Who of mortal men art thou, O most brave? For never yet have I beheld thee in the glorious fight, but now indeed thou hast far surpassed all in thy confidence, since thou hast awaited my long-shadowed spear. Certainly they are sons of the hapless who, have, who meet my strength, but if one of the immortals thou art come from heaven, I would not fight with the celestial gods. For valiant Lycurgus, Son of Dryas did not live long who contended with the heavenly gods. He who once pursued the nurses of raving Bacchus through sacred Nysia. But they all at once cast their sacred implements on the ground, smited by manslaying Lycurgus with an ox goad. But Bacchus too, terrified, sunk under the waves, and Thetis received him affrighted in her bosom. For dreadful trembling had seized him on account of the threat of the man. With him, the peaceful living gods were afterwards enraged, and the son of Saturn rendered him blind. Nor did he live much longer, for he became an object of aversion to all the immortal gods. Wherefore I should not wish to fight with the blessed gods, but if thou art any one of mortals, who eat the fruit of the earth, come hither, that thou mayest speedily reach the goal of death. 
Him then the renowned son of Hippolochus addressed him in turn. Magnanimous son of Tydeus, why dost thou inquire of my race? As is the race of leaves, even such is the race of men. Some leaves the wind sheds upon the ground, but the fructifying wood produces others, and these grow up in the seasons of spring. Such is the generation of men. One produces, another ceases. But if thou wouldest learn even these things, that thou mayest well know my lineage, for many know it, there is a city, Ephyra, in a nook of horse pasturing Argos, there dwelt Sisyphus, who was the most cunning of mortals. Sisyphus, son of Aeolus, and he begot a son, Glaucus. But Glaucus begat blameless Belephron, to whom the gods gave beauty and agreeable manliness. But against him Proetus devised devils in his soul, who accordingly banished him from the state, since he was far the best of the Greeks, for Job had subjected them to his specter. With him the wife of Proetus, noble Antia, passionately longed to be united in secret love, but by no means could she persuade just-minded and well-reflected Belrophon. She therefore, telling a falsehood, addressed King Proetus, Mayest thou be dead, O Proetus, or do thou slay Belphron, who desired to be united in love with me against my will? Thus she said, but rage possessed the king at what he had heard. He was unwilling, indeed, to slay him, for he scrupled this in his mind, but, he se but sent him into Lycia, and gave him fatal characters, writing many things of deadly purport on a sealed tablet, and ordered him to show it to his father-in-law, to the end that he might perish. He therefore went to Lycia, under the blameless escort of the gods, but when now he had arrived at Lycia and the river Xanthus, the king of wide Lycia honored him with a willing mind. Nine days did he entertain him hospitably, and sacrifice nine oxen. But when the tenth rosy-fingered morn appeared, then indeed he interrogated him, and desired to see the token, whatever it was, that he brought from his son-in-law, Proetus. But after he had received the fatal token of his son-in-law, First he commanded him to slay the invincible Chimera, but she was of divine race, not of men, in front a lion, behind a dragon, in the middle a goat, breathing forth the dreadful might of gleaming fire, and he indeed slew, relying on the signs of the gods. Next he fought the, with the illustrious Solini, and, he, and said that he entered on this as the fiercest fight among men. Thirdly, he slew the man opposing Amazons, but for him returning the, the king wove another wily plot. Selecting the bravest men from wide Lycia, he placed an ambuscade, but they never returned home again, for blameless Belphoron slew them all. But when Iopetes knew that he was the offspring of a god, he detained him there and gave him his daughter. He also gave him half of all his regal honor. The Lycians, who separated for him an enclosure of land excelling all others, pleasant, vine-bearing, and arable, that he might cultivate it. But this woman brought forth three children to warlike Belphoron, Isandrus, Hippolochus, and Lyodamia. Provident Joan indeed had clandestine intercourse with Lyodamia, and she brought forth godlike brazen helmet Sarpedon. But when now even he, Belphoron, was become odious to all the gods, he on his part wandered alone through the Aelian plain, pining, pinning his soul and shunning the path of men. But Mars, insatiable of war, slew his son Isandrus, fighting the illustrious Asolmi. And golden reigned Diana, being enraged, slew his daughter. But Hippolochus begat me, and from him I say that I am born. He sent me to Troy, and gave me very many commands. 
always to fight bravely and to be superior to others and to not disgrace the race of my fathers who were by far the bravest in Ephyria and ample Lycia from this race and blood do I boast to be. Thus he said, and Diomede, valiant in the din of war, rejoiced. His spear indeed he fixed in all nurturing earth, and next addressed the shepherd of the people in courteous words. Certainly thou art my father's ancient guests, for in his halls noble Oenus once entertained Belphoron, having detained him for twenty days, and they bestowed valuable gifts of hospitality on each other. Oenus, on his part, gave a belt of shining purple and Belphoron, in turn, a golden double cup, and this I left in my halls when I was coming hither. But Titus I remember not, for he left me whilst I was yet young, when the people of the Greeks perished at Thebes. Wherefore I am a guest friend to the amidst of Argos, and thou art the same to me in Lycia, whenever I shall visit their states. But let us also in the crowd avoid even each other's spears, for there are many Trojans and illustrious allies for me to slay, whomsoever the deity shall present, and I shall overtake with my feet. And there are many Greeks in turn for thee to slay, whomsoever thou canst. But let us exchange arms with each other, that even these may know that we profess to be friends by our ancestors. Thus then, having spoken, Leaping down from their seeds, they took each other's hand and plighted faith. Then Saturnian Jove took away prudence from Glaucus, who exchanged armor with Diomede, the son of Titus, giving golden arms for brazen, the value of hundred beeves for the value of nine. Second reading is from... Uh, a book entitled Norse Mythology or the Re Religion of Our Forefathers by R.B. Anderson, and the section is from the Havamal. I have curated a specific selection uh, based on our theme. He is happy. For whom for himself obtains fame and kind words Less sure is that which a man must have in another's breast. He is happy, who is in himself possesses fame and wit, while living for bad counsels, have oft been received from another's breast. A miserable man, and ill-conditioned, sneers at everything. One thing he knows not, which he ought to know, that he is not free from faults. A guest should depart, not always stay, in one place. The welcome becomes unwelcome, if he is too long continues in another's house. With arms and vestments, friends should each other gladden, those which are in themselves most sightly. Givers and requiters are the longest friends, if all else goes well. To his friend, a man should be a friend, and gifts with gifts requite. Laughter with laughter, men should receive, but leasting with lying. To his friend, a man should be a friend, and to him and to his friend, but of his foe no man shall be, his friend's friend be. Know if thou hast a friend, whom thou trust, fully trustest, and from whom thou wouldest good derive, thou shouldest blend thy mind with his, and gifts exchange, and often to go see him. According to scholars, both Hellistic and Norse philosophies share many similarities, despite evolving entirely separately from one another. As we can see from both of these readings, uh, friends of my, my friends' friends are my friends, and uh, each culture has high weight on who your family's friends are. Both cultures believe that the basic values of a society were virtues, and that happiness can only be obtained in living a virtuous life. Both Norse and Hellenic philosophy stress the importance of relationships and good treatment of friends, but both these cultures' definitions of what kindness and good treatment of friends might be different from ours today, they still highlighted how important it was to their society.
From kindness comes understanding and connections. It fosters empathy and growth, bringing us together as a society. It can allow for people to heal and to continue on their journey. Kindness is building meaningful relationships. Kindness is listening to a friend. Kindness is honesty when necessary. Kindness is caring, empathy, affection, warmth, hospitality, sympathy, and many others. Both ancient and modern cultures agree that kindness fosters community as well as a well-rounded society. We will now move into the ritual part of the observance. Um, as per last time, the background is still under construction, so there is no actual ritual being performed, although if you are wanting to, you can perform your own at home as I read the words out loud. You are also free to read the words out loud with me. We leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of the gods in our world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. As we're still working on the songs, uh, this service is lacking them, but normally there would be a song or two here. Um, but now we shall move into our closing words, which, as with all of the opening words, you are welcome to say along with me, or just listen as I say them. As we move out into the world, let us remember that our, commu our community of faith. Hold dear to the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. And now we usually have our coffee hour, so I'm going to disconnect the recording. And if you want to speak, uh, feel free to use the raise your hand to speak feature. And I will absolutely approve you and we can all hang out and talk. Excellent. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Sun Meadow Temple, and we're so happy that you joined us. My name is Gus, and this is our Pride Month service, and I'm so happy you're here. As always, the service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Currently, Epiphany is out on vacation, as you probably already know, because he likes talking about it. Um, we're going to open today with our open, where's the open word? Hold on. We're going to be opening today with our opening words, which should be on the slide right now, which I just did. We welcome you into the light of the gods and life is fine in celebration. May, may its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love, and open. Wait, no, I think that was the end. You know what? I don't know. Okay. So today is our Pride Month service, Pride Month service, and we will be reading clips from a variety of myths, queer themes. Anyone chatting in the Okay. Keep in mind it is impossible to enforce our modern idea ideas of queer identities onto ancient civilization. But we can take inspiration and awareness that queer identities have existed for thousands of years. As we are reading more than the normal amount of myths, we will not have a discussion portion after. We will begin with Apollo and uh, Hyacinthus, Achilles, and Patroclus, or whatever. Tiresias, or Tiresias, apparently. Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Thor and Loki, and then finally Slayer. Okay, so the first 
Psalm reading is by Lucian of Samasata, and it was translated by H.W. Fowler. Fowler. And yeah. Okay, so it starts with Hermes and Hermes. Why so? Why so sad, Apollo? Apollo said, "Alas, Hermes, my love." Hermes said, "Oh, that's bad. What are you still brooding over?" What are you still brooding over that affair of da that affair of Daphne? Apollo said, "No, I grieve for my beloved, the, Laco the Laconian, the son of Oebolos." Hermes said, "Hyakin, he is not dead." Apollo said, "What?" Hermes said, "Hyakin, he is not dead." Apollo said, "Dead." Hermes said, who killed him? <laughs> who could have the heart? That lovely boy. Apollo said, it was the work of my own hand. Hermes said, you must have been mad. And Apollo replied, not mad, it was an accident. Hermes said, oh, and how did it happen? He was learning to throw the quoit, and I was throwing with him. I had just sent my quoit up into the air as usual when jealous Zephyr said something. Damned he be above all winds. He had long been in love with Hyakin, though Hyakin would have nothing to say to him. Zephyr came thus blustering down. What scripture? It's the works of Lucian of Samasata. I don't know what that means, but it means something. I'm just reading off the script, bro. I don't, I don't got a clue about this shit. Who was I? Zephyr came blustering down from Tagetus and dashed the quoit upon the child's head. Blood flowed from the wounds and streams, and in one moment all was over. My first thought was what was of revenge. I launched an arrow in Zephyr and pursued his flight to the mountain. As for the child, I buried him at Amikle on the fatal spot, and from his blood I have caused a flower to spring up. Sweetest, fairest. <laughs> And from his blood I have caused a flower to spring up, sweetest, fairest of flowers, inscribed with letters of will. Is my grief unreasonable? It is, Apollo. You knew that you had to set your heart upon a mortal. Grieve not, then, for his mortality. All right. So this next thing is called Metamorphosis Ovid, or whatever. It's translated by Henry T. Riley. And it's book 10, Abel 5, and then it's got a lot of the 355. I don't know what 355 is for, but it's a thing. That's it. While such things are being uttered by the prophetic books of Apollo, behold, the blood which poured from the ground has stained the grass, ceases to be blood, and from it, the front end of flower springs up more bright than the Syrian purple. And it assumes the appearance which lilies have were not, were there not in this a purple hue, and in them that of silver. This was not enough for Phoebus, Phoebe, for twas he was that, for twas he that was the author of this honor. He himself inscribed his own. Lamentations on his leaves, and the flower has I I inscribed Therion, and the mournful characters there are true. Nor is Sparta ashamed to have given birth to Hyanthus, and his honors continue to the present time. The Hyacinthian Festival. Returns to each year 
to be celebrated with the prescribed ceremonials after the manner of former celebrations. I have no clue what I just read, but this next thing is by Plato, and it's called Symposium. Very different was the reward of the true love of Achilles towards his lover at Patroclus. <laughs> his lover and not his love. The notion that Patroclus was the beloved one is a foolish error into which I use class. <laughs> How do you say these words? Aeschylus apparently has fallen. For Achilles was surely the fairer of the two, fairer also than the other hero, than all the other heroes. And as Homer informs us, he was still beardless and younger thought. And greatly as the gods honor the virtue of love. Still, the return of love on the part of the beloved to the lover is more admired and valued and rewarded by them, for the lover is more divine. I don't think that. Because he is inspired by God. Now Achilles was quite aware, for he had been told by his mother that he might avoid death and return home and live to a good old age. If he abstained from slaying Hector, if he abstained from slaying him, nevertheless he gave his life to revenge. Nevertheless, he gave his life to revenge his friend and dared to die, not only in his defense, but after he was dead. Wherefore the gods honored him even above Archestus and sent him to the islands of the blessed. These are my reasons for affirming that love is the eldest and noblest and mightiest of the gods, and the chiefest author and giver of virtue and life and of happiness after death. Okay, this one is another part of Metamorphosis by Metamorphosis Ovid. It's translated by Henry T. Riley, Book 3, Fable 5, called Tirasius in its last stanzas 110 through 115. And while these things are transacted uh, on earth by the law of destiny, in the cradle of Bacchus, twice born 66 is secured, they tell that Jupiter or Jupiter by chance was drenched with nectar, laid aside all waiting cares and engaged in some free jokes with Juno. With Juno. In her idle moments she said and, she, and said, decidedly the pleasure of you females is greater than which falls to man. She denied it. It was agreed between them to ask what <laughs> what the opinion of the experienced Teresius to him, both pleasures will, were well known, for he who had separated with a blow of his staff two large bodies, two bodies of large serpent. As they were coupling in a green, as they were coupling in a green wood, and become and become a woman from a man, he had spent seven off. In the eighth. He again saw the same servants and said, If the power of a stroke given, given you is so great as to change the condition of the giver into the other one, I will now strike you again. Having struck the same snakes, his former sex returned, and his origin shape came again. He, therefore, being chosen as um, umpire in the sportive contest, confirmed the loves of Jove. The daughter of Saturn is said to have grieved more than was fit, and not in proportion to the subject. And she condemned the eyes of the umpire to eternal darkness. But the omnipotent father, who does not allow any god to cancel the acts of another being, gave him the knowledge of things to come. And Rekum's. Enricum, I know this word, Enric, 
re recompense for his loss of sight and alleviated his punishment by this harm. I'm sorry, I'm bad at reading. Gilgamesh 33 to 34. Langdon Babylonian section poem, volume 10, number 3. I saw him and was astounded. I loved him as a woman falling upon him in embrace. That one was short. All right, this one is called Norse Mythology by R.D. Anderson. Graf was being thought as he awakened in his hammered goodness. His beard shook, his hair trembled, the sun of earth looked around him. Thus, first of all, he spoke. Mark now, Loki, what I said. What no one knows, either on earth or in high heaven, the hammer is full. Went to Freya's fair dwelling. There, in these words, Thor spoke. Wilt thou, Freya, lend me thy feather dies, that I may, that I my hammer no more may fetch? I gave it thee, I gave it thee gladly. Though it were of gold, I would instantly give it, though it were of silver. Blue then, Loki, the feather dies is. Out he flew from street, from home of Azas, meaning Aesir gods, then he flew to home of Yotna. On the hill sat Thrym, the king of giants, twisted gold bands for his dogs, smoothed at leisure the manes of his horse. Thrym said, How fair the Azas, how fair the elves, why comest thou alone to Yotna? Loki replied, Il fair the Azas, il fair the elves, hast thou concealed the hammer of Thor? Thrym said, I have concealed the hammer of Thor, eight rats beneath the ground. No man brings it back unless he gives me Freya as his wife. Blue then Loki, the feather dies raised. Out he flew from home of Yotun, and he flew to home of Azas. Met with Thor, first of all, and thus addressed him. Hast thou succeeded in doing thine errand? Then tell before perching long messages. What one says, sitting is often of little value, and falsehood speaks who replies. Loki said, well, well, I have succeeded in doing my errand. Thrym has thy, thy hammer, the king of the yeomen. No giant brings it back. No no man brings it back unless he gives him Freya as bride. When they then when they then the fair Freya to find, first then Thor thus address her. Dress thyself, Freya, in bridal robes. Together we will ride to your mm -hmm. Angry grew Freya, and she raged. So the hall of the Azas must shake. Her heavy necklace, Brissingamen, broke, and would then I would <coughs> then I would be a lovesick maid if with thee I would ride to Yotunim. Then all the Azas went to the Ting. To the Ting went all the Asinias, the powerful. Uh, how does it say As It's Asinias. The powerful divinities and held consul. How they should get and held consul. How they should get the hammer back. Then spoke Heimdall, the wife's god, for knowing was he as the Vans are. Dress we Thor in bridal robes, but a singamen he must be wear. Let jingle keys around his waist. Let a woman's dress cover his knees. On his bosom we put broad brooches. And artfully we braid his his hair gray, and artfully we his hair gray. Spoke then Thor, the mighty god, mock me all the Azas would, if in bridal robes I should be dressed. Spoke then Lofi, Lofeson, Lofi, Lofeerson. Be silent, Thor. Stop such talk. 
Soon will Jotnar build an asphalt, if though thy hammer bring not back. Dress they then Thor in bridal robes, for the Singamen he had to wear. Keys let they jingle about his waist, and a woman's dress fell over his knees. On his bosom they placed broad brooches, and artfully they did they, artfully they his hair did braid. Spoke then Loki, for thee I must be servant maid. Ride we both to Jotunheim. Home were driven, then the goats, and hitched to the car. Hasten they must, the mountains crashed, the earth stood in flames. Ulfin's son rode to Jotunheim, spoke then to the king of giants. Giants, arise and spread my benches. Bring to me Freya as bride, Nyokha's daughter from Nolfin. Cows with golden horns go in the yard, black oxen to please the giant. Much wealth have I, many gifts have I. Freya, methinks, is all I lack. Early in the evening came they all. Ale was brought up for the yield. One ox Thor ate, eight salmon, eight. <laughs> Ate salmon and all the delicacies for the woman in temple. Sid's husband, Sid's husband, besides, drank three barrels of mead. Spoke then Thrym to the king of giants, Where hast thou seen such a hungry bride? I never saw a bride eat so much, and never a maid more than me, and drank, drank more mead. Sat there the shrewd maid servant near, thus she replied to the words of Thrym, Nothing ate Freya in nine in eight nights. So much did she long for guilt in him, beyond behind the veil. He sought a kiss, but back he sprang the length of the wall. Why are Freya's eyes so shut? From her eyes it sees that fire doth burn. Sat there the shrewd maid servant near, and thus she spoke, answering the giant. Slept has not Freya for eight nights, so much did she long for Yoki. In came the poor sister of Thrym, a bridal gift she dared to ask. Give me, give from the hands the golden rings, thou dearest friendship of me, friendship of me and love. Spoke then Thrym. The king of giants, bring me the hammer, my bride to Hala. Place the hammer in the lap of the maid. Wed us together in the name of God. Laugh then Thor's heart in his breath. Severe in mind, he knew his hammer first. He knew his hammer first. He slew, he slew Thrym, though the king of giants, crushed then all that race of giants. Slew the old sister of Thrym, she who asked for a bridal gift. Slack she got through shining gold, a hammer blows for heaps of rain. Thus came Ulfin's son again by his hand. That one was long. Okay, this next one is the Elder Edda, or Poetic Edda, of Semun Sikusin. It's translated from the original Old Norse into English by Benjamin Thorpe and the younger Edda of younger Eddas of Snorri Sturluson, was translated by I. A. Blackwell. Of the horse let me thou mast ma thou maddest mention, said Gangle, of the horse let me to whom does he belong, and what is there to say respecting him? Thou seemest to know nothing either about Sleipnir or his origin, replied Hod, but thou wilt no doubt find what thou wilt hear worthy of thy notice. Once on a, once on a time, when the gods were constructing their abodes and had already finished meet Gatka and Valhol, a certain Art, art, artif, artificer, artificer, 
came and offered to build them in the space of three and a half years. A uh, residents so well fortified that they should be perfectly safe from the incursion of the Yotnoth, of the of the ice Yotnoth, and the mountain Yotnoth, even although even although they should have penetrated within the but he demanded for his reward the goddess Maya, together with the sun and moon. After long deliberation, the Asid agreed to his terms, provided he would he would finish the whole work himself without anyone's assistance, and all within the space of one winter. But if anything remained unfinished on the first day of summer, he should forfeit the recom the recom recompense agreed on. On being told these terms, the artificer stipu stipulated that he should be allowed the use of his horse called Speed Dabtua and thus, by the advice of Loki, was granted to him. He accordingly set to work on the first day of winter, and during the night let his horse draw stone from the building. The enormous size of the stone struck the Asir with astonishment, and they saw clearly that the horse did one half more of the toilsome work than his master. Their bargain, however, had been concluded in the presence of witnesses, and therefore by solemn oaths, for these without precaution. For without these precautions, a Jotun would not have thought himself safe among the Asir, especially when Thor returned from an expedition he had then undertaken towards the east against evil beings. As the winter drew to a close, the building was far, was far advanced, and the bulwarks were sufficiently high and massive to render this residence impregnable. In short, when it wanted but three, when it wanted but three days to summer, the only part that remained to be finished was the gateway. Then sat the gods on their seats of justice and entered into con consolation, inquiring of one another who among them, who among them could have advised to give Freya away to you and him, or to plunge the heavens in darkness by permitting the giant to carry away the sun and moon. They all agreed that no one but Loki, the son of Rolfe, and the author of so many evil deeds, could have given such bad counsel, and that he should be put to a cruel death if he did not contrive some way or other, prevent the artificer from completing his task and obtaining the situated re re recompense. recompense. They immediately proceeded to lay hands on Loki, who, in his fright, promised upon oath that it would that let it cost him what it would. He would so manage matters that the man should lose his reward. That very night, <sighs> sorry, excuse me, I on. That very night, when the artificer went with Bobby for building stone, a mare suddenly ran out of a fort suddenly ran out of the forest and began to neigh. The horse, being thus excited, broke loose and ran after the mare into the forest, which obliged the man also to run after the horse. And thus between one and the other and thus between one and the other the whole night was lost, so that at dawn the work had not made the usual progress. The man, seeing that he had no other means of completing his task, resumed his own gigantic statue. And the gods now clearly perceived that it was that it was in reality a mountain giant who had come amongst them. No longer regarding their eggs, they therefore called on Thor, who immediately ran to their assistance, and lifting up his hammer Mjolnir, paid the workmen his wages, not with the sun and moon, and not even by sending them back to the For with the first blow he shattered the giant's skull to pieces, and hurled him headlong headlong from Nipohim. But Loki had ran such a race with Svaldifari that shortly after he bore a gray fowl with eight legs. This is the horse they 
which excels at all horses ever possessed by gods or men. Okay, we're done reading. Thankfully. This month, as we celebrate the diversity of our world, let us remember those who came before and those who fought for the world we now have today. We will now move into the ritual part of the observance. If you want to, you can join us at home and read the words aloud or just listen. Uh, I need to change the theme. You are welcome to com complete the ritual at home. We, live this, we leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of gods and of the gods in the world. We welcome life and bless our offering to oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods in our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. Okay. We're done. With that part. evening, morning, or middle of the day, wherever you are at this time, and welcome to Sun Metal Temple. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba, and I use she, her pronouns. This is our first July service, and I'm so happy you are here. As always, this service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. For any general announcements, uh, I know I keep talking about the background, but I'm working on it. Uh, the and with the products, we've had one of our um, sisters, who uh, isn't a member, but who is helping us with products, has uh, come up with a great idea, which I will share with you uh, later when we work out some of the kinks. But due to all of the issues with Reddit and similar, we've had some massive delays in things such as the technology, the songs, the products, all of that stuff has just been delayed, <laughs> I was like. So we're going to start with our opening words. As per usual, you can read them uh, aloud at home or just listen to me read them. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. Okay. So, our theme for this month is friendship, which is a deeply important thing across many pagan revivalists face, sorry that's a mouthful, and is something that can often be challenging as a pagan in today's world. There we go. <laughs> our readings today uh, are Irish Fairy Tales, uh, Hesiod, De Officius by Cicero, and the have them all. So we'll start with Irish fairy tales. Here, a gay band went, carrying rich treasure to decorate the pavilion of a monster lord. On another road, a vat of seasoned yew, monstrous as a house on wheels, and drawn by a hundred laborious oxen, came bumping and joggling, the ale that thirsty Connaught princes would drink. On a road again, the learned men of Leinster, each with an idea in his head that would discomfort a northern olive and make a southern one gape and fidget, would be marching solemnly, each by a horse that was piled high on the back and widely at the sides with clean peeled willow or oaken wands that were carved from the top to the bottom with the Ogham signs, the first lines of poems, for it was an offense against wisdom to commit more than initial lines to writing, the names and dates of kings, the procession of laws of Terra and of the sub-kingdoms, the names of places and their meanings, 
On the brown stallion ambling peacefully yonder, there might go the warring of gods for two or ten thousand years. Thus mare with the dainty pace, and the vicious eye might be sidling under a load of oaken odes, in honor of her owner's family, with a few bundles of tales of wonder added in case they might be useful. And perhaps the restive piebald was backing the history of Ireland into a ditch. On such a journey, all people spoke together, for all were friends, and no person regarded the weapon in another man's hand other than as an implement to poke a reluctant cow with or to pacify with loud wallops some hoof-proud colt. Okay. So then we will do uh, Hesiod's. Let friends oft bidden to thy feast repair. Let not a foe the social moment share. Chief to thy open board the neighbor call, when unforeseen domestic troubles fall. The neighbor runs ungirded, kinsmen wait, and luring for their arraignment hasten late. As the good neighbor is our prop and stay, so is the bad a pitfall in our way. Thus blessed or cursed, we this or that obtain, the first a blessing and the last a bane. How should thine ox by chance untimely die? The evil neighbor looks and passes by. If aught thou borrowest well the measure weigh, the same good measure to thy friend repay. Or more, if more, thou canst unask, concede, so shall he promptly supply thy future need. Usurious gains avoid usurious gain. Equivalent to loss will prove thy bane. Who loves thee love, him woo that woos. Give to the giver. Right now we are doing <laughs> De Officius uh, by Cicero. They say that Damon and Phintias of the Pythagorean school enjoyed such ideally perfect friendship that when the tyrant Dionysus had appointed a day for the execution of one of them and the other who had been condemned to death requested a few days respite for the purpose of putting his loved ones in the care of friends, the other became surety for his appearance, with the understanding that if his friend did not return, he himself should be put to death. And when the friend returned on the day appointed, the tyrant in admiration for their faithfulness begged that they would enroll him as a third partner in their friendship. Okay. And our final reading for today is from the Havamal, which I hope I'm saying that right. I practiced it a lot. <laughs> With arms and vestments, friends should each other gladden, those which are in themselves most sightly. Givers and requiters are longest friends. If all goes well to his friend, a man should be a friend, and gifts with gifts requite, laughter with laughter, men should receive, but leasing with lying to his friend. A man should be a friend to him, his friend, but of his foe no man shall. His friend's friend thee, know if thou hast a friend whom thou fully trusteth, and from whom thou wouldest good derive. Thou shouldest blend thy mind with his, and gifts exchange, and often go to see him. Okay. So, as I sat down to write this piece uh, at my computer, I decided that probably the first thing I should do would be to Google friendship and other values within paganism today. I was uh, hoping to find some stories about great pagan friendships or how people had connected through paganism. Instead, I was printed with a barrage of messages to people like Ask Amy and other advice columns, suggesting or telling stories of how when discovering uh, their friends' pagan faiths, people ended decades-long friendships. In addition, there were many articles talking about how to use your friendship to convert pagans' um, and other faiths to your own faith. 
I had a very visceral reaction and yelled out the word yik um, as I began to read many of these articles. As expected, one of the most first articles began with that common biblical phrase, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, and of course included many similar biblical verses and stories. Many advised people to pray for their friends, even when asked not to, and a lot of other just terrible, disrespectful, boundary-stomping methods. I was deeply uncomfortable and began scrolling to see if I could find other resources and articles that would assist me in the search for true stories of pagan friendships, but the limited results showed me that I was not likely to find what I was looking for. These search results were truly a surprise for me, because most of my time spent online is within other pagan circles or groups, and I forget how much disapproval for our practices and beliefs exists outside of these circles. For many pagans, religion, while it's still deeply important, is not the deciding factor in a friendship. Treating others well and being good to your friends is a cornerstone in most pagan faiths, our shared values and perspectives on friendship lead us to be able to bond across religions that might have conflicting points without being in conflict with one another, and as such, we have a, such a deeply bonded community. This is not to say that pagans are perfect, or that pagan communities are, but it is to say that our major differences don't cause us any strife in our relationships, and these differences causing strife is not something we would allow in our friendships. We base our friendships on respect, cooperation, acceptance, enjoyment, and shared values, not specific religious beliefs. Many past pagans hold similar values, with the Havamal from earlier discussing how to be a good neighbor and friend, and Irish folk tales saying all people spoke together, for all were friends, and no person regarded the weapon in another man's hand other than as an implement to poke a reluctant cow or to pacify with loud wallops some hoof-proud colt. Major philosophers like Aristotle discuss friendship and say that friends must witch each other goodwill and be virtuous people. These values that we hold dear and are such a part of our literature and philosophies allow us to connect more deeply with each other, to understand, have empathy, and be loyal to one another to weave a tapestry of a variety of human experiences and stories, and to brighten our world rather than keep close those whose threads resemble our own. As our closing words say, go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. So, we will now move into the ritual part of our observance. Uh, if you want, you can join us at home with, along with the ritual, which I have not ever gotten a chance to show you due to um, our background and stuff not being ready, but there will be a real ritual at a time for this, along with these words, and you are welcome to read along, um, or just have me listen, or just listen to me as I read the words aloud. We leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of the gods in our world. Life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. So now we will move into our closing words, um, which, as always, you are welcome to say along with me or just listen as I say. As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. So now we will move into our coffee hour portion and I will turn off the recording and you all can rest to speak. Good evening and welcome to Sun Metal Temple. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba and I use she, her pronouns. This is our second July service and I'm so happy you are here. As always, this service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. I know we've had some turmoil in the associated communities this week and I hope everyone is doing well despite that. 
as per usual, the background is still being worked on. And due to questions this week, I realized I didn't explain why it's taking so long. So here we go. Most of the background is a decorated bookshelf, but part of it is a big sign, which I am hand decorating, uh, and including measuring out letters and other things, which is adding greatly to the time. Uh, as for the songs committee, I will hopefully uh, have them meet soon. I have been working with our outside consultants, and they're still wor willing to work with us, uh, though they currently have some other commitments. Uh, as for our products and the issues with our advertising platforms, we have uh, pushed these back, but we are still getting to work on them. We also hopefully will have a new consultant joining us soon who will be able to help us with arts and stuff. Uh, our finances are currently looking great, and we have $284.13 after our advertising partnership and purchase of software to make these observances possible. This is up from our last meeting where we had $227.95. As a reminder, you are allowed to register for membership at any time by filling out the form and sending us the fees, which can be done monthly or annually. As we have also uh, been talking about... About. You can leave us money in your will, too, or as the beneficiary of your life insurance policy if you are interested. We will now move into our opening words, which should not appear on the slide behind you. And you are welcome to read along at home, or just listen as I read them out loud. We welcome you into the light of the gods, and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith cherishing love and with open hearts. So our theme for this month is still friendship and I'm sure some of you remember the personal story I told last week about how in my research for the previous observance uh, I only dug up results about how to convert your pagan friends to, to other religions and just how to leave friendships with pagans because they did not agree with our religion. This was deeply depressing, and to compensate, I have decided that this week I would be collecting uh, pagan stories from members and others across the pagan sphere. Uh, there was more interest expressed than anticipated, so this project will be expanding after this month. And as such, our readings today are slightly different, uh, as they are personal stories from members and other pagans about friendship. With this, there are many stories that contain unhappy elements uh, and other things, so please remember to be ex respectful. Here I am also to put in a content warning. This observance is much darker than previous observances and should not be watched by anyone under 18. This one is for us old over 18ers only. It involves mental health issues, uh, attempted unliving, uh, attempted hate crimes, and drug use. Please, please, please... If, you, if this is going to be too hard for you to listen to or watch, skip this one. We have three this month. You will not be missing much. Uh, this, our, second, our next service after this will be more back to our regular programming. Okay. So our first reading is from someone who wishes to remain anonymous. Um, they said, I met my two best friends, my sisters, when there was talk of adding a more accurate occult themes into a role-playing server. It evolved into a channel for occult and witchy stuff. The server is gone now, uh, but we're still a mini coven. Our second one is from a member of our members called Wyatt. I've been looking for ages for a forum or group of anything to feel like I'm in a community of pagans like me. Following people on Instagram and TikTok isn't the group setting of the correct vibe. I never really had many friends, especially no one I could talk to about pagan stuff. I'm googling to try to find a good community uh, that's more like a forum or group chat, uh, the Discord. Sun Meadow Temple uh, came up. This uh, is an excellent Discord. Uh, I believe there's a spelling error in here. Hold on. Uh, don't know what that's supposed to say, but uh, to have more say. Uh... <laughs> okay, anyway. Uh, to have more say in the temple, but can also be a non pagan member like me. I uh, have now made friends and we share memes, pagan and non-pagan related, have conversations about pagan and non-pagan related issues, and it makes me feel not alone since I don't know any pagans in real life and don't have many friends in real life. This one is from Micro Maria. Uh, I came to the pagan community online because I felt alone. There aren't many pagans around my IRL environment, and I just needed like-minded people for sharing my religious experiences at the time. I found a few friends on Tumblr, and it was great. But it wasn't until I migrated to Reddit that I found my IRL bestie. Uh, we started chatting over a post about Hades, which we both venerated and were devoted to, but we never really stopped this conversation. 
two years later and we're still talking 24 7. We became partners on so many things and by now it's less of a pagan friend I found on the internet and more like the person who knows me more than anyone else in the world uh, and still chooses to stay and create crazy things with me. It's true that we bonded over our common religious interests but I've been a close friend for life. I thank the gods for that connection. My best friend is everything I ever wanted in a friend within and outside of religious circles. So this one is from Just. About a year or so ago, I came across this cool person at work who I later learned was a Hellenic pagan. While I was still very much in the broom closet with my faith, she, now he, helped me realize that I wasn't completely alone and that paganism is a lot more common than I previously thought. They were a great influence to me in my openness about paganism, so I may uh, show to closeted pagans that there are more of us than they think and that they're not alone. Today I'm still friends with him, and he even hangs out in Sun Middle Temple, although he's not very active. He plays Minecraft with us a lot, though. So this one is Evie, and this one has a couple of content warnings on it, so if you listened up until now, uh, this would be the time to stop. Please, please be considerate of your own mental health when listening to this video. My only close bond friendship with another pagan was back when we met as co-workers. We got along pretty well due to us having the same first name. Uh, I've met a couple of pagans before in person, and well, those of them that were nice enough to call friends. I can't say any of us became close, as for my ex-co-worker we still communicate. So, the story of how we met goes as follows. One day at work, she happens to uh, notice the rings I wear and the necklace around my neck and proceeds to question me about them. She discovers that I am an open book, and I tell her about my items, uh, and that my belief system is chaotic but understandable. In return, she tells her side and brings out the exact same necklace I have, and displays it as if fate was like, yeah, you two are chill. Be chill together. Uh, then at this business, there were four, in this person included, paganish people working, and they were all friends. As all things must pass, so did two of them. By that I mean they quit and left for a better job. She stayed with me to suffer at this bad job. <laughs> anyway, we continued to talk, even off work, uh, and just basically formed our little small group. And I kid you not, this is what we called ourselves and have tattoos of. Uh, we dubbed ourselves the Pagan Pals. And even have this stupid dance-like greeting every time we see each other. I still do the same dance as I mentioned the name of the group. Uh, well, one day, uh, her demons got the best of her, and she tried to take her life. She had a bad night, and she was called me in the middle of the night, knowing that I would be awake, and I answer, and she's crying and telling me how she's so sorry for what she's going to do. Now, before I continue, I have to say this. My view on life is a little different than most people, uh, but what made me convince her not to go uh, through with it wasn't because of her life or any of those other things, um... Uh, that you would commonly tell someone such as, I care about you, or whatever. Uh, what made me tell her no was that she was a mother, and she couldn't abandon her kids. Let's say. Let's say. I told her, you know, if you go, then there wouldn't be a pagan pals anymore. It would just be me. And that worked, and saved her somehow. And it was a really clever and scary situation. At the time of writing this, this was maybe four to five years ago, and they ha they have not tried again, and nor have I. We still talk, and uh, she knows whenever she needs someone to fall on, I'm there. She made me a little handmade box with runes and everything, uh, with all these things inside, because I didn't have a proper altar. I cherish the gift and use it to keep important things safe, and it keeps me safe. Um... I just thought that our friendship was strong enough to be mentioned in this project. Okay, so this one is from um, The Weaver System. This is Banjax of The Weaver System. I don't know if the story counts for this. It does. It's really just some funny stuff that happened both within The Weaver System and with a witch friend of The Weaver System. So the system had been having snakes on the mind for a couple of months, looking up snakes, snake deities, etc., Prism is fronting, and they're all like, you know, maybe someone's trying to talk to me. So they talk to a witch friend of the Weaver system, who I will call Lyric. They ask Lyric if there's some entity contacting us. 
didn't even need to be specific, just an indicator of whether one or more of us was getting pinged. They go silent for a minute as they do their channeling thing, and then they come back with, yeah, no, there's nothing unusual, just the usual stuff. So, like, uh, Leela, who is one of the members of the system, has been doing some work on the substructures of the system. You're probably just picking up on her stuff. She probably feels powerless in the world, and she's needing an expert uh, to have some control over something. And there's a five-second pause, then Lyric chimes in and says, Oh, by the way, Tiamat would like a candle. None of us had ever knowingly dealt with Tiamat. Uh, and this is when I kind of sober up, because I realized I'd had a few chats that I just figured was an imaginative flare, like a fragment that formed to be an imaginary friend, just a supportive daydream. That daydream Jen looks at me with a shit-eating grin that somehow also got a warm look like she cares, but she also got one over on me. Meanwhile, Prism, over there, is like, well, Leela's a caregiver by nature, and double GTF, does Tiamat not somehow count as an entity trying to contact us? What does Lyric say? I thought you knew, she's been there for months. I was like, when I say there was a collective dead silence and incredulous looks in the headspace on reading that, I realize that if I mean pins, consistent gravity, and coherent flow exist in our headspace, you'd hear a pin drop. Prism then asks the second deadly question, are there any other surprises you haven't mentioned? They gave us a small list of surprises. You mean you really didn't know? They also mentioned that Tiamat seemed to be in contact with one of us, which was when I kind of had to admit my unintentional involvement. The incredulous looks fell upon me, and I kind of just shambled deeper into the darkness of the headspace. Okay, so, this person gave their name in Irish, I believe it's Irish, and I'm not even going to try, because I will absolutely butcher this person's name. Uh, but uh, they told this story about, um, they gave the Wiccan kid a ride to work a few times. He was kind of creepy and we didn't stay in contact. He would talk about opening portals to hell in the cemetery on Halloween at night. He got fired for faking a shoulder injury and hexed the plant manager. That manager was one of the most oppressively stupid people I've ever met, and I could never tell if that he was naturally that dumb or if it was because of the hex. Other people rhetorically wondered if he was high, too, so it wasn't just that I got a bad impression. Other than my short time buddy... Chris, I had no other pagan friends. And so this final story will be my story. Uh, it's just a comical one. So my friend and I were in the hallway at our high school. This was a couple of years ago. So we were walking down the hallway, you know, just chatting about random stuff, mentioned paganism, chatting a little bit about paganism and pagan practices, uh, the normal stuff. And as we're doing so, uh, a dude stops us and is like, what are you talking about? You know, what, what, I heard you mention this. What does this mean? And so, you know, we're like, oh, cool, a person who's respectfully interested in something. And uh, we, you know, stop and we explain to him what we're talking about, what's going on, all of this stuff. And here would be a good time to remind everyone that I live in a red state full of conservative people. So uh, it's going great, you know. Oh, and I also have to remind you that spitting on someone is a felony in this state. Uh, because it is considered um, biological warfare. <laughs> so, we're having all this conversation and stuff. Dude stops, sort of turns at us and goes, Oh, so you're like devil worshippers who eat babies! And we're like, uh, no, we're specifically not that. But of course, you know, then he tries to spit on us, and we all we just sort of stepped out of the way. He didn't really have the greatest aim, and it hit the wall, and we all just sort of looked at it, and then just moved on with our lives. You know, the normal thing you do after someone commits a felony at you. <laughs> like, it is now one of the most comical stories that we recount at many settings, because it is so ridiculous that this happened. Like, another one is, uh, I tried to explain paganism one time at the same school, and uh, someone continually asked me if I thought the wooden chair was alive because it was made of wood, and I said we worship nature. Looking back, the people at my high school, I think had brains made of rocks. <laughs> like, 
But anyway, those, that is our complete collection of stories for today. And we will now move into the ritual portion. As I said earlier, I promise I'm working on the background and stuff. I just have not gotten totally to it yet. It takes me a lot of time to do block letters, in, you know, that match in size. Anyway, so then you're now going to move into the ritual part of the observance. Uh, if you want to, you can join us at home and read the words aloud, or you can just listen. You are also welcome to complete the ritual at home. Uh, I've mentioned that the background is still under construction. For now, I'll just read the words aloud. So, we leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of uh, the gods in the world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. So now we will do our closing words. Oh, before we do that, I am to tell you about we are, if you still want to submit a friendship story, uh, that will be happening. We are expanding this project uh, to archive just all sorts of stories of pagan friendship across platforms and cultures. Uh, so that we have this archive so that no one ever has to Google pagan friendship again and only find very gross things, as well as just to weave a fabulous tapestry of human connection with different threads and experiences. So if you're interested in that, uh, please comment below this video, uh, reach out in our Discord, you know, let me know what you're in if you're into it, you know, let me know on Instagram if you see this or uh, in the Reddit beneath these videos, let me know and I will totally uh, reach out and help you and we will explain everything that's going on. So, so now for our closing words. <laughs> As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. And that's all for today. Thank you, everyone. I'm now going to turn off the recording. Good evening. Good evening, and welcome to Sun Meadow Temple. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba, and I use she, her pronouns. This is our third July service, and I'm so happy you're here. As always, the service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Remember, as today's service is an odd third one this month, we will be doing something different after our readings. As the last service was age-restricted, I realized some of you did not hear the announcements, so I repeat them today. For those of you who have already heard the announcements, feel free to skip ahead to the readings. As per usual, the background is still being worked on, and due to questions last week, I realized I didn't explain why it is taking so long. Most of the background is the decorated bookshelf, but part of it is a big sign which I am hand-decorating, including measuring out letters and things which is adding some time. As for the songs committee, I will hopefully have them meet soon. I have been talking to our outside consultant, and they're still willing to work with us, but currently having other commitments. As for our products, the issues with our advertising platforms have pushed these back, but we were still working on them. We also hope to have a new consultant joining us soon who will help us with arts and stuff. Our finances are looking great. We currently have $284.13 after our advertising partnership on Instagram and purchase of software that makes these observances possible. This is up from our last meeting when we had $227.95. As a reminder, you are allowed to register for membership at any time by filling out the form and sending us the fees, which can be done monthly or annually. As we have also been talking about, you can leave us money uh, in your will or as the beneficiary of your life insurance policy if you are interested. Okay, so we will now move on to the opening words, which will appear on the screen behind you. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So our theme for this month is friendship, and our readings today are from the Havamal and Symposium, as well as Welsh and Celtic fairy tales. So our first reading is from the Havamal. I counsel thee, Lord Fafnir, to take advice. Thou wilt profit if thou takest it. If thou knowest thou hast a friend whom thou well canst trust, go oft to visit him. 
for with brushwood overgrown and with high grass is the way that no one treads. I counsel thee, Lord Fafnir, to take advice. Thou wilt profit if thou takest it. A good man attract to thee in pleasant converse and salutary speech learn while thou livest. I counsel thee, Lord Fafnir, to take advice. Thou wilt profit if thou takest it. With thy friend be thou never first to quarrel. Care gnaws the heart. If thou to no one canst thy whole mind disclose, I counsel thee, Lord Fafnir, to take advice. Thou wilt profit if thou takest it. Words thou never shouldest exchange with a witless fool. And our next reading is from Symposium. They're very short today. Uh, he may pray and entreat and supplicate and swear and lie on a mat at the door and endure a slavery worse than that of any slave. In any other case, friends and enemies would equally ready to prevent him. But now there is no friend who will be ashamed of him and admonish him, and no enemy will charge him with meanness or flattery. So our next one is Welsh and Celtic fairy tales. Unfortunately, I do not speak Welsh, so while I have looked into the pronunciations of these words, they may not be completely accurate. That as the result of frequently meeting one another, he and she became great friends. They usually met in a particular spot in Cwm Druid Gwynd, where the girl and her family lived, and there, where there were all kinds of nice things to eat, of amusements and of incomparable music. But he did not make up to anybody there except the girl. And then our second story from Welsh fairy tales. Now the head servant and the son were bosom friends. They were like brothers together, or rather twin brothers. As the son and the servant were such friends, the farmer's wife used to get exactly the same kinds of clothes prepared for the servant as for her son. The two fell in love with handsome young women of very good reputation in the neighborhood. The two couples were soon joined in honest wedlock, and great was the merrymaking on the occasion. So that ends our readings for today's, and we will be moving into our fun activity. Drum roll, please. We will be playing Cards Against Humanity, Pagan style. I'll post the link uh, to the game in the chat. Keep in mind, I had some trouble finding decks that were pagan-oriented, so it'll be more dominated by some paths than others, but you should be able to write your own cards as well to make up the difference. And I hope everyone has a wonderful time. Good evening, and welcome to Sun Meadow Temple. We are so happy. Good evening and welcome to Sun Meadow Temple. We are so happy you've joined us. My name is Alba and I use she her pronouns. This is our first August service and I'm so happy you are here. As always, the service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. If you have not heard, all of our bylaws have undergone an update uh, to fit more what we do now rather than what we did in the past. If you have any questions, concerns about what was updated, uh, please feel free to ask me in the chat. All of our products, like the Kids Resources, the Monastery Report, and the Friendship Project are going well, and we have a lot done on many of them. As per the feedback on our service that went out, uh, there is still interest in email blasts and the products, which I'll still continue producing, and we'll start working with the products soon. I also feel the need to offer clarification, as this has come up repeatedly. For the observances, I have never put the words on the screen behind me, as they're often simply massive blocks of text, which would make it very difficult for me uh, to run and make the slideshows. On top of this, I know why some people have been asking about what the, why the graphics changed, and the reason for that is the copyright laws that are very, very complicated and make it difficult for me to find licensed and accessible graphics for us to use. If you would like to draw or produce your own works or send them to me, I would be delighted to include them in the background of our slideshow. But for now, it will continue to be any graphics that I make and use because we don't have to pay for licensing or work through any copyright laws to use those. So now we will open today with our opening words, which will appear on the screen behind you. Feel free to just listen as I read them or read along at home. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So if you didn't already know, we are doing this month a little differently as everyone is getting super busy with school and transitioning into the 
part of the year that's usually more busy with all the holidays, but we'll return to our usual content in September. So instead of a service today, we have an altar building competition on our Minecraft server. We had two participants and two altars that were completed, which will appear on the upcoming slides. Voting on the winner has since closed, and the final slide will announce the winner. So option one went with more of a natural and a plant theme, and option two went with much more of an expensive and opulent theme in the context of Minecraft money. So drum roll, please. The winner is option one. Congratulations to our winner. Thank you to all of our participants, and we will be hosting this type of event in the future if you wish to participate. Hope everyone has a wonderful month of August. Good evening or morning, and welcome to Sun Metal Temple. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba, and I use she, her pronouns. This is our first September service, and I am so happy that you are here. As always, this service will be recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. We have many events in the upcoming months, including a few movie nights and art and cake contests, as well as our usual holiday videos. On that note, please submit any images you have of harvest or changing to fall um, at the email below, which for some reason isn't up here. That's very frustrating. Anyway, it's the email in the announcements channel. I will update you on more our events as they come up, uh, but please join us for our September 23rd Harvey Harvest Movie Night, which we'll have instead of our regular observance like this. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot announce the movie until then, but it will. it is a great movie. Much beloved. All right. So we will open today with our opening words, which will appear on the slide. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So, our theme uh, for this month is change and we have some rather silly readings and some rather less silly readings. But so our first reading today uh, is the Odyssey book 10 and book 17 by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler, if that matters to you, and um, Hesiod, translated by Charles Abraham Elton, uh, sections 80 to 82. So our first reading uh, is as follows. It's the Odyssey book 10. Their hearts sank as they heard me, for they remembered how they had been treated by the Laestragonian Antifith, Antiphates and the savage ogre Polyphemus. They wept bitterly in their dismay, but there was nothing to be got by crying. So I divided them into two companies and set a captain over each. I gave one company to Eurylochus while I took command of the other myself. Then we cast lots in a helmet, and the lot fell upon Eurylochus. So he set out with his twenty-two men, and they wept as we also as also did we who were left behind. When they reached Circe's house, they found it built of cut stones on a site that could be seen from far in the middle of the forest. There were wild mountain wolves and lions prowling all around it, poor bewitched creatures whom she had tamed by her enchantments and drugged into submission. They did not attack my men, but wagged their tails and fawned upon them, and rubbed their noses lovingly against them as hounds crowd round their master when they see him coming from dinner, for they know he will bring them something. Even so did these wolves and lions with their great claws fawn upon my men. But the men were terribly frightened at seeing such strange creatures. Presently, they reached the gates of the goddess's house, and as they stood there, they could hear Circe within, singing most beautifully as she worked at her loom, making a web so fine, so soft, and of such dazzling colors as no one but a goddess could weave. On this, Polites, whom I valued and trusted more than any other of my men, said, There is someone inside working at a loom and singing most beautifully. The whole place resounds with it. Let us call her and see whether she is woman or goddess. They called her, and she came down, unfastened the door, and bade them enter. They, thinking no evil, followed her, 
all except for Eurylochus, who suspected mischief and stayed outside. When she had got them into her house, she set up them upon benches and seats, and mixed with them a mess mixed them a mess with cheese, honey, meal, and Permian wine but she drugged it with wicked poisons to make them forget their homes. And when they had drunk, she turned them into pigs by a stroke of her wand and shut them up in her pigsties. They were all like pigs, head, hair, and all, and they grunted just as pigs do, but their senses were the same as before, and they remembered everything. Thus then were they shut up squealing, and Circe threw them some acorns and beech masts, such as pig eat, pigs eat, Eurylochus hurried back to tell me about the sad fate of our comrades. He was so overcome with dismay that though he tried to speak, he could find no words to do so. His eyes filled with tears, and they could only sob and sigh, till last we forced his story out of him, and he told us what had happened to the others. We went, he said he, as you told us, to the forest, and in the middle of it there was a fine house filled with cut stones in a place that could be seen from far. There we found the woman, or else she was the goddess, working at her loom and singing sweetly. So the men shouted to her and called her, whereupon she at once came down, opened the door, and invited us inside. The others did not suspect any mischief, so they followed her into the house, but I stayed where I was, for I thought there might be some treachery. From that moment I saw them no more, for not one of them ever came out, though I sat a long time watching for them. Then I took my sword of bronze and slung it over my shoulders. I also took my bow and told Eurylochus to come back with me and shrewed me the way. But he laid hold of me with both hands and spoke piteously, saying, Sir, do not force me to go with you, but let me stay here, for I know you will not bring back one of them with you, nor even return alive yourself. Let us rather see if we cannot escape at any rate with the few that are left, for we may still save our lives. So that was um, Circe turning the men into pigs, uh, which is book 10. So this is book 17. Uh, and this is when Odysseus is disguised and has returned uh, to his home of Ithaca. As they were thus talking, a dog that had been lying asleep raised his head and pricked his ears. This was Argos, whom Ulysses had bred before setting out for Troy, but he had never had any work out of him. In the old days, he used to be taken out by the young men when they went hunting wild goats or deer or hares, but now that his master was gone, he was ne lying neglected on the heaps of mule and cow dung that lay in front of the stable doors, till the men should come and draw it away to manure the great clothes, and he was full of fleas. As soon as he saw Ulysses standing there, he dropped his ears and wagged his tail, but he could not get close up to his master. When Ulysses saw the dog on the other side of the yard, he dashed a tear from his eyes without Eumaeus seeing it, and said, Eumaeus, what a noble hound that is over on the manure heap. His build is splendid. Is he as fine a fellow as he looks? Or is he one of those dogs that come begging about a table, and they are kept merely for show? This hound, answered Eumaeus, belonged to him who has died in a far country. If he were what he was when Ulysses left for Troy, he would soon show you what he could do. There was not a wild beast in the forest that could get away from him when he was once on its tracks. But now he has fallen on evil times, for his master is dead and gone, and the women take no care of him. Servants never do their work when their master's hand is no longer above them. For Jove takes half the goodness out of a man when he makes a slave of him. As he spoke, he went inside the buildings to the cloister where the suitors were, but Argos died as soon as he had recognized his master. So then. This is our final reading, which is Hesiod, and it's 80 through 82. Few thy crops in season crown thy fields, lest thou to strangers' gates penurious rove, and every needy effort fruitless prove. Even as to me thou camest, but no hope more, that I shall give or lend thee of my store. O foolish Persis, be the labours thine. 
which the good gods to earthly man assign. Lest with thy spouse, thy babes, thou vigrant ply, and sorrowing crave those alms which all deny. Twice may thy plaints been in again favor again, and haply thrice may not be poured in vain. If still persisting plead thy weary prayer, thy words are not thy eloquence is air. Did exhortion move, the thought should be, from debt releasement, days from hunger free. A house, a woman, and a steer provide, thy slave to tend the cows, but not thy bride. Within let all implements abound, lest with refused entreaty wander round. If thy wants still press, the season glide away, and thou with scanted labor mourn the day. Thy task defer not till the morn arise, or the third sun the unfinished work surprise. The idler never shall his garners fill, nor the he defers and lingers still. Lo, diligence can prosper toil, the loiterer strives with loss and extricates the soil. When rests of the keen strength of overpowering sun, from heat that made the pores in rivers run. When rushes in fresh rains, autumnal joe, and man's unburdened limbs now lightly er move, for now the star of the day within transient light rules over our heads and joys in longer night. When from the worm the forest boils our sound, trees bud no more, but earthward cast around. Their withering foliage then remember well the timely labor and thy timber fell. So as many of you know, as part of my education, I take a variety of classes on religion and of course, more specifically on paganism. And while many of our readings today were on more general change, like the passing of times, or jokingly becoming pigs, it is important to consider the personal and institutional changes that paganism has made during its revival. While today paganism is a much more isolated and personal religion, it used to be a major state religion within many places. Everyone worshipped similarly, and you could find common ground easily. It was also intrinsically tied into the laws of the places where it was worshipped. Nowadays, for many of us, the situation is the opposite. It can be hard to find another pagan or a safe space to be one. It can be even harder to find a state law that pertains to us, as well as most of the laws being made today do not. These changes often lead to pagans struggling to find community uh, and, making is in and making it increasingly difficult to practice in more unsafe regions. However, this too is changing. The National Geographic recently published a very well-written article on paganism, and many others have come out from similar sites uh, throughout the last couple of years. Sites like Stonehenge and others have allowed the reopening of their historical spaces for revived pagan worshippers, and businesses, as well as events are geared, geared towards us, are opening more frequently. Much of this change has come from people who've had the ability to advocate and spread our ideas and teachings, as well as those with the ability to educate and work for change in the world. The work of advocating for change is not always easy. It can be dangerous and unenjoyable at times, but allows others to change as well, and hopefully we can all start to change the world for a better place. So, we will now move into the ritual part of the observance. Uh, if you want, you can join us at home and read the words aloud or just listen. You are welcome to complete a ritual at home as well at this time. Uh, as the background is still under construction, uh, I will just read the words aloud. We leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of the gods in our world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. So we will now do our closing words. As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. 
Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. And now we will move into our coffee hour. So I'll turn off the recording and everyone can come and join us to speak. Good evening and welcome to Sun Middle Temple. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba and I use she, her pronouns. This is our first October service and I'm so happy you are here. As always, this service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, please keep in mind that we have our ongoing contest to decorate a scary cake, as well as our upcoming movie night. Also, please submit any videos or images that you have for our holiday video by the 28th. We will open today with our opening words, which will appear on the slide behind you. Uh, feel free to listen or read along at home. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So, as is fitting, our theme this month is death, and our reading today is an excerpt from Book 11 of the Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. As this reading is quite long, uh, the, portion of the portion after this will be shortened, and we will only have one reading today. So, here, Peremides and Eurylochus held the victims, while I drew my sword and dug the trench a cubit each way. I made a drink offering to all the dead, first with honey and milk, then with wine, and thirdly with water. And I sprinkled white barley meal over the whole, praying earnestly to the poor feckless ghosts, and promising them that when I got back to Ithaca I would sacrifice a barren heifer for them, the best I had, and would load the pyre with good things. I also particularly promised that Tiresias should have a black sheep to himself, the best in all my flocks. When I had prayed sufficiently to the dead, I cut the throats of the two sheep and let the blood run into the trench, whereupon the ghosts came trooping up from Erebus, brides, young bachelors, old men worn out with toil, maids who had been crossed in love, and brave men who had been killed in battle, with their armor still smirched with blood. They came from every quarter and flitted around the trench with a strange kind of screaming sound that made me turn pale with fear. When I saw them coming, I told the men to be quick and flay the carcasses of the two dead sheep and make burnt offerings of them, and at the same time to repeat prayers to Hades and Persephone. But I sat where I was with my sword drawn and would not let the poor feckless ghosts come near the blood till Tiresias should have answered my question. The first ghost that came was that of my comrade Elpnor, for he had not yet been lain beneath the earth, but we had left his body unwaked and unburied in Circe's house, for we had had too much else to do. I was very sorry for him, and cried when I saw him. Elpinor, said I, how did you come down here into this gloom and darkness? You have got here on foot quicker than I have with my ship. Sir, he answered with a groan, it was all bad luck and my own unspeakable drunkenness. I was lying asleep on top of Circe's house and never thought of coming down again by the great staircase, but fell right off the roof and broke my neck, so my soul came down to the house of Hades. And now I beseech you by all those whom you have left behind you, though they are not here, by your wife, by the father who brought you up, when you were a child, and by Telemachus, who is the one hope of your house, do what I shall ask you. I know that when you leave this limbo, you will again hold your ship for the Aeon island. Do not go thence leaving me unawaked and unburied behind you, or may I may bring heaven's anger upon you, but burn me with whatever armor I have, Build a barrow for me on the seashore that may tell people in days to come what a poor unlucky fellow I was, and plant over my grave the oar I used to row with when I was alive and with my messmates. And I said, my poor fellow, I will do all that you have asked of me. Thus then did we sit and hold sad talk with one another, I on the one side of the trench with my sword held over the blood, and the ghost of my comrade saying all this to me from the other side. Then came the ghost of my dead mother Anticlea, daughter to Autolycus. 
I had left her alive when I set out for Troy, and was moved to tears when I saw her. But even so, for all my sorrow, I would not have let her come near the blood till I had asked my questions of Tiresias. Then came also the ghost of Theban Tiresias, with his golden scepter in his hand. He knew me and said, Ulysses, noble son of Laertes, why, poor man, have you left the light of day and come down to visit the dead in this sad place? Stand back from the trench and withdraw your sword so that I may drink the blood and answer your questions truly. So I drew back and sheathed my sword, whereon when he had drank the of the blood he began with his prophecy you want to know he said about your return home but heaven will make this hard for you i do not think you will escape the eye of neptune who still nurses his bitter grudge against you for having blinded his son still after much suffering you may get home if you can restrain yourself and your companions when your ship reaches the Thrinassian island where you will find the sheep and cattle belonging to the sun, who sees and gives ear to everything. If you leave these flocks unharmed and think nothing but of getting home, you may yet after much hardship reach Ithaca. But if you harm them, then I forewarn you of the destruction both of your ship and of your men." Even though you may yourself escape, you will return in bad plight after losing all your men in another man's ship, and you will find trouble in your house, which will be overrun by high-handed people who are devouring your substance under the pretext of paying court and making presents to your wife. When you get home, you will take your revenge on these suitors, and after you have killed them by force or fraud in your own house, you must take a well-made oar and carry it on and on, till you come to a country where the people have never heard of the sea and do not even mix salt with their food, nor do they know anything about ships and oars that are as the wings of, ship, of a ship. I will give you this certain token, which cannot escape your notice. A wayfarer will meet you, and will say it must be a winnowing shovel that you have got upon your shoulder. On this you must fix the oar in the ground and sacrifice a ram, a bull, and a boar to Neptune. Then go home and offer hecatombs to all the gods in heaven, one after the other. As for yourself, death shall come to you from the sea, and your life shall ebb away very gently when you are full of years and peace of mind, and your people shall bless you. All that I have said will come true. This I answered, must be as it may please heaven but tell me and tell me and tell me true i see my poor mother's ghost close to us she is sitting by the blood without saying a word and though i am her own son she does not remember me and speak to me tell me sir how can i make her know me that he said i can soon do any ghost that you let taste of the blood will talk with you like a reasonable being but if you do not let them have any blood, they will go away again. On this, the ghost of Tiresias went back to the house of Hades, for his prophesyings had now been spoken. But I sat still where I was until my mother came up and tasted the blood. Then she knew me at once and spoke fondly to me, saying, My son, how did you come down to this abode of darkness while you are still alive? It is a hard thing for the living to see these places, for between us and them there are great and terrible waters, and there is Oceanus, which no man can cross on foot, but he must have a good ship to take him. Are you all this time trying to find your way back home from Troy, and have you never yet got back to Ithaca, nor seen your wife in your own house? Mother, said I, I was forced to come here to consult the ghost of Theban prophet Tiresias. I have never been near the Achaean land, nor set foot on my native country, and I have had nothing but one long series of misfortunes from the very first day I set out with Agamemnon for Ilius, the land of noble steeds, to fight the Trojan. But tell me, and tell me true, in what way did you die? Did you have a long illness, or did heaven vouchsafe you a gentle and easy passage to eternity? Tell me also about my father, and the sum 
whom I left behind. Is my property still in their hands, or has someone else got hold of it who thinks I shall not return to claim it? Tell me again what my wife intends doing, and in what mind she is. Does she live with my son and guard my estate securely, or has she made the best match she could and married again? My mother answered, Your wife still remains in your house. But she is in great distress of mind and spends her whole time in tears both night and day. No one as yet has got possession of your fine property, and Telemachus still holds your lands undisturbed. He has to entertain largely, as of course he must, considering his position as a magistrate, and how everyone invites him. Your father remains at his old place in the country and never goes near the town. He has no comfortable bed nor bedding. In the winter he sleeps on the floor in front of the fire with the men, and goes about all in rags. But in summer, when the warm weather comes on again, he lies out in the vineyard on a bed of vine leaves thrown, anyhow upon the ground. He grieves continually about your never having come home, and suffers more and more as he grows older. As for my own end, it was in this wise. Heaven did not take me swiftly and painlessly in my own house, nor was I attacked by any illness such as those that generally wear people out and kill them. But my longing to know what you were doing and the force of my affection for you, this it was that was the death of me. Then I tried to find some way of embracing my poor mother's ghost. Thrice I sprang towards her and tried to clasp her in my arms, but each time she flitted from my embrace, as it were a dream or a phantom, and being touched by the quick, I said to her, my mother, why do you not stay still when I would embrace you? If we could throw our arms around one another, we might find sad comfort in the sharing of our sorrows, even in the house of Hades. Does Persephone want to lay a still further load of grief upon me by mocking me with a phantom only? My son, she answered, most ill-fated of all mankind. It is not Persephone that is beguiling you, but all people are like this when they are dead. The sinews no longer hold the flesh and bone together. These perish in the fierceness of consuming fire as soon as life has left the body, and the soul flits away as though it were a dream. Now, however, go back to the light of day as soon as you can, and know all these things that you may tell them to your wife hereafter. We can see how humanity has not changed over the thousands of years. People still miss their mothers and families after death, and still try to contact them continuously. We can also see much about the treatment of dead and sacrifices that we can use in our current practices, although many of us no longer have access to blood sacrifices. We can also learn how our ancestors uh, can currently connect with us. All the people who uh, came before us uh, died and the changing of the seasons shows that death is a natural part of life and that we should show respect uh, for the cycles of life and death. We will now move into the ritual part of the observance. If you want to, you can join us at home and read the words aloud or just listen. Uh, you are still welcome to complete uh, the ritual at home. I will be inserting a video ritual uh, in future observances. This way it will be easy for everyone to participate in view. So, we leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of the gods in our world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. So now we will do our closing words. As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. Good evening and welcome to Sun Middle Temple. We Good evening, and welcome to Sun Middle Temple. We are so happy you've joined us. My name is Alba, and I use she, her pronouns. This is our second October service, and I'm so happy that you are here. As always, this observance is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, please, everyone, remember that we have an ongoing cake decorating contest, uh, as well as an upcoming movie night, 
And uh, as per usual with all holidays, please submit any videos or images that you have for the holiday video. All of these are due are happening on the 28th. So you have five days. We will open today with our classic opening words, which will appear on the slide behind you. Um, please read along at home or feel free to just listen. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So our theme for this month is death, and our readings today are an excerpt from Book 18 of the Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler, and Metamorphosis by Ovid, Book 10, Eurydice and Orpheus, translated by Henry T. Riley. As these recordings are quite long, the after portion of these will be shortened. So we'll begin with um, Metamorphosis, Book 10. Thence Hymenaeus, clad in saffron-colored robe, passed through the unmeasured tract of air and directed his course to the regions of the Sasonians. In vain was invoked by the voice of Orpheus. He presented himself indeed, but he brought with him neither auspicious words nor joyful looks, nor yet a happy omen. The torch, too, which he held, was hissing with a smoke that brought tears to the eyes, and as it was, it found no flames amid its waving. The issue was more disastrous than the omens, for the new-made bride, while she was strolling along the grass, attended by a train of naiads, was killed, having received the sting of a serpent on her ankle. After the Raphodian bard had sufficiently bewailed her in the upper realms of air, that he might try the shades below as well, he dared to descend to Styx by the Tyrrhenian gate and amid the phantom inhabitants and ghosts that had enjoyed the tomb. He went to Persephone, and him that held these unpleasing realms, the ruler of the shades, and touching his strings in concert with his words, he thus said, O ye deities of the world that lies beneath the earth, to which we all come at last, each that is born to mortality, if I may be allowed and you suffer me to speak the truth, laying aside the artful expressions of a deceitful tongue, I have not descended hither from curiosity to see dark Tartarus, nor to bind the threefold throat of the Medusian monster, bristling with serpents, but my wife was the cause of my coming, into whom a serpent trodden upon by her diffused its poison and cut short her growing years. I was wishful to be able to endure this, and I will not deny that I have endeavored to do so. Love has proved stronger. That God is well known within the regions above. Whether he be so here too, I am uncertain. But yet I imagine that even here he is. And if it was the story of the rape of former days is not untrue, t'was love that united you two together. By these places filled with horrors, by this vast chaos, and by the silence of these boundless realms, I entreat you, weave over again the quick spun thread of the life of Eurydice. To you we all belong, and having stayed but a little while above, sooner or later we all hasten to one abode. Hither are we all hastening. This is our last home, and you possess the most lasting dominion over the human race. She too, when in due season, she shall have completed her allotted number of years, will be under your sway. The enjoyment of her I beg as a favor. But if the fates deny me this privilege in behalf of my wife, I have determined I will not return. Triumph in the death of us both. As he said such things, he touched the strings to his words. The bloodless spirits wept. Tantalus did not catch at the retreating water, and the wheel of Lixon stood still as though in amazement. The birds did not tear the liver of Titius, and the granddaughters of Belus paused at their urns. Thou, too, Sisyphus, didst, didst seat thyself on thy stone. The story is that then, for the first time, the cheeks of Eumenides, overcome by his music, were wet with tears. Nor could the royal consort, nor he who rules the infernal regions, endure to deny him his request, and they called for Eurydice. She was among the shades newly arrived, and she advanced with slow pace by reason of her wound. 
The Rephodian hero receives her, and at the same time this condition, that he not turn back his eyes until he is past the Averinian valleys, or else the grant will be revoked. The ascending path is mounted in deep silence, steep, dark, and enveloped in deepening gloom. And now they were not far from the verge of the upper earth. He, enamored, fearing lest she should flag and impatient to behold her, turned his eyes, and immediately she sank back again. She hapless one, both stretching out her arms and struggling to be grasped and to grasp him, caught nothing but the fleeting air. And now, dying a second time, did she, did, she did not at all complain of her husband. For why should she complain of being beloved? And now she pronounced the last farewell, which scarcely did he catch with his ears, and again she was hurried back to the same place. No otherwise was Orpheus amazed at this twofold death of his wife than he who trembled beheld the three necks of the dog, the middle one supporting chains, whom fear did not forsake before his former nature deserted him, as stone gathered over his body, and then Olenus took him who took himself the crime of another, and was willing to appear guilty, and then thou, unhappy Lethea, confiding in thy beauty, breasts once most united, now rocks which the watery Ida supports. The ferryman drove him away, entreating and in vain, desiring again to cross the stream. Still for seven days, in squalid guise, did he sit on the banks without the gifts of Ceres. Vexation and sorrow of mind and tears were his sustenance. Complaining that the deities of Erebus were cruel, he betook himself to lofty Rodope and Hymaeus, buffeted by the north winds. The third titan had now ended the year bounded by the fishes of the ocean, and Orpheus had avoided all intercourse with women, either because it had ended a misfortune to him, or because he had given promise to that effect. Yet passion possessed many a female to unite herself to the bard, and many a one grieved when repulsed. He was also the first adviser of the people of Thrace to transfer their affections to tender ewes, and on this side of manhood to enjoy the short spring of life and its early flowers. So we'll now move into our next reading, which is the Iliad, uh, book 18. Meanwhile, the fleet runner Antilochus, who had been sent as messenger, reached Achilles, and found him sitting by his tall ships and boding that which indeed to... Surely true. Alas, he said to himself, in the heaviness of his heart, why are the Achaeans again scouring the plain and flocking towards the ships? Heaven grant the gods, be not now bringing that sorrow upon me, of which my mother Thetis spoke, saying that while I was yet alive, the bravest of the Myrmidons should fall before the Trojans and see the light of the sun no longer. I feel the brave son of Menoetus has fallen through his own daring, and yet I bade him return to the ships as soon as he had driven back those that were bringing fire against him, and not join battle with Hector. As he was thus pondering, the son of Nestor came up to him and told him his sad tale, weeping bitterly the while. Alas, he cried, the son of noble Pelus, I bring you bad tidings. Would indeed that they were untrue. Patroclus has fallen, and a fight is raging around his naked body, for Hector holds his armor. A dark cloud of grief fell upon Achilles as he listened. He filled both his hands with dust off the ground and poured it over his head, disfiguring his comely face, and letting the refuse sizzle over his shirt so fair and new. He flung himself down all huge and hugely at full length and tore his hair with the strands. The bondswoman whom Achilles and Patroclus had taken captive screamed aloud for their grief, beating their breasts, and with their limbs failing them for sorrow. And Telachus bent over him uh, the while, weeping and holding both his hands as he lay groaning, for he feared he might plunge a knife into his own throat. Then Achilles gave a loud cry, and his mother heard him as she was sitting in the depths of the sea by the old man her father, whereon she screamed, and all the goddesses' daughters of Nerus that dwelt at the bottom of the sea came gathering round her. There was Glaucia, Thalia, Simodosi, 
Nesea, Spo, Fo, and Dark Eyed Halle, Simotho, Actea, Liminoria, Melite, Ieria, Dexamene, Amphinomene, Calianaria, Doris, Penope, and the famous scene of Galatea, Nemertes, Apsuedes, and Calanacea. There was also Clemene, Ianerea, Anasia, Maera, Orethuia, and Amanthea of the lovely locks, with the other Nereids who dwell in the depths of the sea. The crystal cave was filled with their multitude, and they all beat their breasts while Thetis led them in their lament. Listen, she cried, sisters and daughters of Nereus, that you may hear the burden of my sorrows. Alas, woe is me, woman that I have borne the most glorious offspring. I bore him fair and strong, hero among heroes, and he shot up as a sapling. I tended him as a plant in a goodly garden, and sent him with his ships to Ilus to fight the Trojans. But never shall I welcome him back into the house of Pelus, so long as he lives to look upon the light of the sun. He is in heaviness, and though I may go to him, I cannot help him. Nevertheless, I will go, that I may see my dear son, and learn what sorrow has befallen him, though he is still holding aloof from battle. She left the cave as she spoke, while the others followed weeping after, and the waves opened the path before them. When they reached the rich plain of Troy, they came up out of the sea in a long line onto the sands, at the place where the ships of the Myrmidons were drawn up in close order around the tents of Achilles. His mother went up to him as he lay groaning. She laid upon her hand upon his head and spoke piteously, saying, "'My son, why are you thus weeping? What sorrow has now befallen you?' Tell me, hide it not from me. Surely Jove has granted you the prayer you made him, and when you lifted up your hands and besought him that the Achaeans might all of them be pent up at their ships and ruined bitterly, that you were no longer with them. Achilles groaned and answered, Mother, Olympian Jove has indeed vouchsafed me with the fulfillment of my prayer, but what boots it to me seeing that my dear comrade Patroclus has fallen, he whom I valued more than all the others, and loved as dearly as my own life. I have lost him, I, and Hector, when he killed him, stripped the wondrous armor so glorious to behold which the gods gave to Pelus when... They laid you in the couch of a mortal man. Would that you were still dwelling among the immortal sea nymphs, and that Pelus had taken himself some mortal bride. For now you shall have grief infinite by reason of the death of that son, whom you can never welcome home. Nay, I will not live nor go about mankind, unless Hector falls by my spear, and thus pay me for having saved Patroclus, son of Menoetus. Thetis wept and answered, Then, my son, is your end near at hand, for your own death awaits you full soon after that of Hector. Then said Achilles, in his great grief, I would die here and now, and that I could not save my comrade. He has fallen far from home, and in his hour of need my hand was not there to help him. What is there for me? Return to my own land I shall not, and I have brought no saving to neither to Patroclus nor to my other comrades, of whom so many have been slain by mighty Hector. I stay here by my ships, a bootless burden upon the earth. I, who in fight have no peer among the Achaeans, though in council there are better than I. Therefore perish strife among strife both from among gods and men, and anger wherein even a righteous man will harden his heart which rises up in the soul of a man like smoke, and in the taste thereof is sweeter than drops of honey. Even so has Agamemnon angered me, and yet so it must be, for it is over. I will force my soul into the subjugation, as I needs must I will go. I will pursue Hector who has slain him, whom I love so dearly, and will then abide my doom when it may please Jove and the other gods to send it. Even Hercules, the best beloved of Jove, even he could not escape the hand of death, but fate and Juno's fierce anger laid him low, 
as I too shall lie when I am dead, if like a doom awaits me. Till then I will win fame, and will bid a Trojan and Ardinian women wring tears from their tender cheeks, with both their hands in the grievousness of their sorrow. Thus they shall know that he who has held aloof for so long will hold aloof no longer. Hold me not back, therefore, in the love you bear me, for you shall not move me. One of the main things present throughout both of these pieces is grief. Through this we can see that humans in the past and the present uh, are very, very similar. They had the same feelings, and we can always emphasize, empathize with those in the past and the future. Connection to people throughout history expands our community and allows us to connect with those who have gone before. So, so. We will now move into the ritual part of the observance. If you want to, you can join us at home and read the words aloud or just listen, and you are welcome to complete the ritual at home. Uh, I will be recording a ritual, and so there will be in the future a ritual recorded video that will go here. We leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of gods in the world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. Closing words. So now on to our closing words. As we move into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. Good evening and welcome to Sun Middle Temple. We are so happy you've joined us. Good evening and welcome to Sun Middle Temple. We are so happy you've joined us. My name is Alba and I use she, her pronouns. This is our November service and I'm so happy that you are here. As always, the service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. This month, we attended our first in-person event and got a good response and some information from other organizations that run similarly to ours. Uh, we also have a movie night, and you can all vote on which movie to watch. I have posted the list of available and appropriate films for you all to vote on, and we will watch on the 20th. We are also having a church art contest this month. You can submit any drawing you want that's related to the church. This can be an artistic logo, an architect's drawing of a church, or an altar design uh, for us or anything similar. We will open today with our opening words, which will appear on the slide behind you. Please just listen or read along at home. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So our theme for this month is Aging and Growing, and our readings today are the Iliad Book 9 and Odyssey Book 17, both by Homer and translated by Samuel Butler. So we begin with Book 9. My mother Thetis tells me that there are two ways in which I may meet my end. If I stay here and fight, I shall not return alive. But my name will live forever, whereas if I go home, my name will die. But it will be long ere death shall take me. To the rest of you, then, I say, go home, for you will not take Illis. Jove has held his hand over her to protect her, and her people have taken heart. Go, therefore, as in duty bound, and tell the princes of the Achaeans the message that I have sent them. Tell them to find some other plan for the saving of their ships and people. For so long as my displeasure lasts, the one that they have now hit upon may not be. As for Phoenix, let him sleep here, that he may sail with me in the morning, if he so will. But I will not take him by force." They all held their peace, dismayed at the sternness with which he had denied them, till presently the old knight Phoenix, in his great fear for the ships of the Achaeans, burst into tears and said, Noble Achilles, if you are now minded to return, and in the fierceness of your anger will do nothing here to save your ships from burning, how, my son, can I remain here without you? Your father Peleus bade me to go with you when he sent you here as a mere lad from Phythia to Agamemnon. You knew nothing 
neither of war nor of the arts whereby men make their mark in counsel, and he sent me with you to train you in all excellence of speech and accent. Therefore, my son, I will not stay here with you. No, not though heaven itself vouchsafe to strip my gears off me and make me young as I was when I first left Hellas, the land of fair women. We will now move on to book 17. Um, this is the story of Argos. This is a sad story. Um, if you are not prepared for animal death, this is not a story that you should listen to, um, and you should skip ahead. As they were thus talking, a dog had been lying asleep, raised his head, and pricked up his ears. This was Argos, whom Ulysses had bred before setting out for Troy, but he had never had any work out of him. In the old days, he used to be taken out by the young men when they went hunting wild goats or deer or hares, but now that his master was gone, he was lying neglected on the heaps of mule and cow dung that lay in front of the stable doors till the men should come home and draw it away to manure the great clothes. And he was full of fleas. As soon as he saw Ulysses standing there, he dropped his ears and wagged his tail, but he could not get close to his master. When Ulysses saw the dog on the other side of the yard, he dashed a cheer from his eyes, without Eumaeus seeing it, and said, Eumaeus, what a noble hound that is over yonder on the manure heap. His build is splendid. Is he as fine a fellow as he looks, or is he only one of those dogs that come begging about a table and are kept merely for show? This hound, answered Eumaeus, belonged to him who has died in a far country. If he were what he was when Ulysses left for Troy, he would soon show you what he could do. There was not a wild beast in the forest that could get away from him when he was once on its tracks, but now he has fallen on evil times, for his master is dead and gone, and the women take no care of him. Servants never do their work when their master's hand is no longer over them, for Jove takes half the goodness out of a man when he makes a slave of him. As he spoke, he went inside the buildings to the cloister where the suitors were, but Argos died as soon as he had recognized his master. Paganism is a religion that attracts a wide audience and age group. Many traditions are many other traditions are struggling to maintain their populations for a variety of reasons, but paganism is still growing throughout the world. Our ability to change and be manageable for all people is what makes us appealing to the masses. We can operate both as a counterculture movement that supports those who have been neglected and exiled from the public sphere, and provide a safe home for all kinds of people who are looking for spirituality. As we grow and we evolve into even more paths, some are more traditional than others, we can be loyal to where we came from, while also realizing that things are not the same and will need to change. Listening and learning from the past and using it to build our future is a deeply important part of paganism. So as you are all likely aware, this is the month that San Middle Temple originally began, and we have changed a lot since our beginning. Our holiday videos and observances have begun in this past year, and our other celebrations continued. In the future, we hope to include real streamed rituals for holidays and events. Um, well, this year, we were able, able to attend our first event, and it went very well. We hope to grow and provide access for even more types of things. So for the next year, I have some very exciting events planned, so everyone get really, really um, jazzed for some of those. So there will, of course, probably be some growing pains, you know, then we'll have to adjust, but we can always be like Argos, celebrating the return of the past while still having lived and making sure we stay in our, you know, modern lives. So now we'll now move into the ritual part of the observance. If you want to, you can join us at home and read the words aloud, or you are welcome to complete a ritual at home. Uh, for this time, everything is still sort of under construction, and so I will just read the words aloud. Oh, 
And don't forget, if you have not already、um, looked at our、um, dis- end of year survey, please fill that out and say it has some questions about this and about our ritual and what you guys would like、uh, for it to be. So now I will read the ritual words. We leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. So we gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of gods in the world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. So as we'll now do our closing words. Which will also appear on the slide behind you, and you can feel free to say them or not say them. So, as we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. Good evening and welcome to Sun Middle Temple. We are so happy you have joined us. My name is Alba and I use she/her pronouns. This is our first December service and I'm so happy that you are here. As always, the service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. This month we have a few events going on, including an ugly sweater contest, a recipe collection, a movie night, and a New Year's party. We also have our end of the year survey running as well, and our time updates for 2024, which are super important. And please, I beg you to fill them out. And the links are available on all of our social media pages, as well as in our Discord. So we will open today、uh, with our opening words, which will appear on the slide behind you. Feel free to listen or read along at home. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So our theme this month, as is fitting, is light in the darkness,、uh, and our readings today are Hector and Andromache from Book Six and the Phoenix. Role of Patrocles from Book Twenty Three, both from the Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler. Please keep in mind that these clips can be pretty sad, so if you are not in the headspace to hear them, please skip this observance. So our first clip is Hector and Andromache. When he had gone through the city and reached the Sicyon gates, through which he would go out onto the plain, his wife came running towards him, Andromache. Daughter of the great Yitzhan, who ruled Thebes under the wooded slopes of Mount Placus, and was king of the Sicilians, his daughter had married Hector, and now came to meet him with a nurse who carried his little child in her bosom, a mere babe, Hector's darling son, and lovely as a star. Hector had named him Scamandrius, but the people called him Astynax. For his father stood alone as chief guardian of Elias. Hector smiled as he looked upon the boy, but he did not speak. And Andromache stood by him, weeping, taking his hand in her own. "Dear husband," said she, "your valor will bring you destruction. Think on your infant son and on my hapless self, who ere long shall be your widow. For the Achaeans will set upon you in a body and kill you." It would be better for me, should I lose you, to lie dead and buried, for I shall have nothing left to comfort me when you are gone, save only sorrow. I have neither father nor mother now. Achilles slew my father when he sacked Thebes, the goodly city of the Sicilians. He slew him, but did not, for very shame, despoil him. When he had burned him in his wondrous armor, he raised a barrow over his ashes. And the mountain nymphs, daughters of Aegeus bearing Jove, planted a grove of elms about his tomb. I had seven brothers in my father's house, but on the same day they all went within the house of Hades. Achilles killed them, as they were with their sheep and cattle. My mother, who had been queen of all the land under Mount Placus, he brought hither with the spoil and freed her for a great sum. But the archer queen Diana. Took her in the house of your father, nay Hector, you who to me are father, mother, brother, and dear husband, have mercy upon me. 
Stay here upon this wall. Make not your child fatherless and your wife a widow. As for the host, place them near the fig tree, where the city can best be scaled, and the wall is weakest. Thrice have the bravest of them come thither and assailed it under the two Ajaxes, Idiomenus, son of Artris, and brave son of Titus, either of their own bidding or because some soothsayer had told them. And Hector answered, Wife, I too have thought about upon all this, but with what face should I look upon the Trojans, men or women, if I shirk battle like a coward? I cannot do so, for I know nothing save to fight bravely in the forefront of the Trojan host and win renown alike for my father and myself. Well do I know that the day will surely come when mighty Ilus shall be destroyed with Pyram and Pyram's people. I, but I grieve for none of these, not even for Hecuba nor King Pyram, for my, nor for my brothers and brave who may fall in the dust before their foes. For none of these do I grieve as for yourself, when the day shall come on which some one of the Achaeans shall rob you forever of your freedom and bear you weeping away. It may be that you will have to ply the loom in Argos at the bidding of a mistress, or to fetch water from the springs of Messius or Hyperia, treated brutally by some cruel taskmaster, then will one who sees you weeping. She was the wife to Hector, the bravest warrior among the Trojans during the war before Ilus. On this your tears will break forth anew for him who would have put away the day of captivity from you. May I lie dead under the barrel that is heaped over my body, ere I hear you cry as they carry you into bondage. He stretched his arms towards his child, but the boy cried and nestled in his nurse's bosom, scared at the sight of his father's armor and at the horse plume that nodded fiercely from his helmet. His father and mother laughed to see him, but Hector took the helmet from his head, laid it all gleaming upon the ground. Then he took his darling child, kissed him, and dandled him in his arms, praying over him the while to Jove and to all the gods. Jove, he cried, Grant that this my child may be even as myself, chief among the Trojans. Let him be not less excellent in strength, and let him rule Ilias with his might. Then may one say of him as he comes from battle, The son is far better than the father. May he bring back the blood-stained spoils of him whom he has laid low, and let his mother's heart be glad. With this he laid the child in the arms of his wife, who took him to her own soft bosom, smiling through her tears. As her husband watched her, his heart yearned towards her, and he caressed her fondly, saying, My own wife, do not take these things too bitterly to heart. No one can hurry me down to Hades before my time. But if a man's hour is to come... Be he brave or be he coward, there is no escape for him. When he has once been born, go then within the house and busy yourself with your daily duties, your loom, your distaff, and the ordering of your servants. For war is a man's matter, and mine above all others of them that have been born in Ilis. He took his plumed helmet from the ground, and his wife went back again to her house, weeping bitterly, and often looking back towards him. When she reached her home, she found her maidens within, and bade them all join in her lament. So they mourned Hector in his own house, though he was yet alive, for they deemed that they should never see him return safe from battle and from the furious hands of the Achaeans. Our next reading is from Book 23, and is The Funeral of Patroclus. Then the princes of the Achaeans took the son of Peleus to Agamemnon, but hardly could they persuade him to come with them, so wroth was he for the death of his comrade. As soon as they reached Agamemnon's tent, they told the serving men to set a large tripod over the fire in case they might persuade the son of Peleus to wash the clotted gore from this body, but he denied them sternly and swore with a solemn oath, saying, Nay, by King Jove, 
first and mightiest of all gods, it is not meet that water should touch my body till I have laid Patroclus on the flames, and have built him a barrow, and shaved my head. For so long as I live, no such second sorrow shall ever draw nigh me. Now therefore let us do all the sad festival demands. But at break of day, King Agamemnon, bid your men bring wood and provide all else that the dead man may duly take into the realm of darkness. The fire shall thus burn him out of our sight the sooner, and the people shall turn again to their own labors. Thus he did speak, and they did even as he had said. They made haste to prepare the meal. They ate, and every man had his full share so that all were satisfied. As soon as they had enough to eat and drink, the others went to their rest, each in his own tent, but the son of Peleus lay grieving among his myrmidons by the shore of the surround sounding sea in an open place where the waves came surging in one after another. Here a very deep slumber took hold upon him and eased the burden of his sorrows, for his limbs were weary with chasing Hector round windy Ilis. Presently the sad voice of Patroclus drew near him like what he had been in stature, voice, and the light of his beaming eyes, clad too as he had been clad in life. His spirit hovered over his head and said, You sleep, Achilles, and have forgotten me. You loved me living, but now that I am dead you think of me no further. Bury me with all speed that I may pass the gates of Hades, the ghosts' vain shadows of men that can labor no more. Drive me away from them. They will not yet suffer me to join those that are beyond the river, and I wander all desolate by the wide gates of the house of Hades. Give me now your hand, I pray you, for when you have once given me my dues of fire, never shall I again come forth out of the house of Hades. Never more shall we sit apart and take sweet counsel among the living, the cruel fate." which was my birthright, has yawned its wide jaws around me. Nay, you two Achilles, peer of gods, are doomed to die beneath the wall of the noble Trojans. One prayer more I will make you, if you will grant it. Let not my bones be laid apart from yours, Achilles, but with them, even as we were brought up together in your own house when that what time... Menoetus brought you to me as a child from Opius, because by sad spite I had killed the son of Amphidamus, not of set purpose, but in childish quarrel over the dice. The knight Pelus took me into his house and treated me kindly and named me to be your squire. Therefore let our bones lie but in a single urn, the two-handled golden vase given to you by your mother. And Achilles answered, why, true heart, are you come hither to lay these charges upon me? I will of my own self do all as you have bidden me. Draw closer to me. Let us once more throw our arms around another and find sad comfort in the sharing of our sorrows. He opened his arms toward him as he spoke and would have clasped him in there, but there was nothing, and the spirit vanished as vapor, gibbering and whining into the earth. Achilles sprang to his feet, smote his two hands, and made lamentation, saying, Of a truth, even in the house of Hades, there are ghosts and phantoms that have no life in them. All night long the sad spirit of Patroclus has hovered overhead, making piteous moaning, telling me what I am to do for him, and looking wondrously like himself. Thus he did speak and his words set them all weeping and mourning about the poor dumb dead, till rosy-fingered born appeared. Then King Agamemnon sent mule, men and mules from all parts of camp to bring wood, and Marionus, squire to Idiomenus, was in charge over them. They went out with woodsmen's axes and strong ropes in their hands, and before them went the mules. Up hill and down dale did they go, by straightways and crooked, and when they reached the heights of many fountained Ida, they laid their axes to the roots of many a tall branching oak that came thundering down as they felled it. They split the trees and bound them behind the mules, which then wended their way as 
they best could through the thick brushwood onto the plain. All who had been cutting wood bore logs for the Marionis squire to Idiomenus had bid them. And they threw them down in a line upon the seashore at the place where Achilles would make a monument for Patrick Cleese and for himself. Both of these stories are about retaining humanity and light in the midst of war and darkness. In the first, Hector and Andromache celebrate their son and love him, and in the second, the Greeks stop to say goodbye to a fallen comrade all in the midst of war. All of these people embrace the darkness and the light that occurs seems even brighter by contrast. The contrast of the bright holiday lights against the dark of the Christmas tree and the house against the fabric of the night sky both shine bright in the darkness and are a part of classic winter celebration as well as leading lights in the dark of winter. Gifts, family, friends, and food all bring light to the darkness of winter, or adding light to it if you're in the southern hemisphere. Embrace the darkness in contrast to the night and celebrate the contrast. We will now move into the ritual part of the observance. If you want to, you can join us at home or read the words aloud or just listen. Say, please remember to do the end of year um, survey as it has some questions on this part. We leave this offering for our guides to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of gods in the world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. As we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. Good evening and welcome to Sun Meadow Temple. Good evening and welcome to Sun Meadow Temple. We are so happy you've joined us. My name is Alba and I use she, her pronouns. This is our second December service and I'm so happy you are here. As always, the service is recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. This month, we have a few events going on, including an ugly sweater art contest, a recipe collection, movie night, and a New Year's party. We'll also have our end-of-the-year survey running, as well as our time updates for 2024, which are both super important and I would love for you to fill out. The links are in our social media, as well as our Discord. We will open today with our opening words, which will appear on the slide behind you. Feel free to read along at home, or just listen. We welcome you into the light of the gods and light this flame in celebration. May its brightness symbolize our connection to the gods and the natural world. May you join us in this community of faith, cherishing love and with open hearts. So if you remember from our last observance, our theme this month is light in the darkness. And so our readings today are Odysseus in the Land of the Dead from Book 6 of the Iliad by Homer, translated by Samuel Butler, and Prometheus. Um, from Hesiod, and I don't appear to have the translator on my notes, but it will be on the slide. So please keep in mind this first story um, is a little bit sad, so if you're not in the headspace for this one, please skip to the story of Prometheus. So, on this, the ghost of Tiresias went back to the house of Hades, for his prophet seeings had now been spoken. But I sat there still, where I was, until my mother came up and tasted the blood. Then she knew me at once and spoke fondly to me, saying, My son, how did you come down to this abode of darkness while you are still alive? It is a hard thing for the living to see these places, for between us and them there are great and terrible waters, and there is Oceanus, which no man can cross on foot, but he must have a good ship to take him. Are you all this time trying to find your way back home from Troy? Have you never yet got back to Ithaca, nor seen your wife in your own house? Mother, said I, I was forced to come here to consult the ghost of 
the Theban prophet Tiresias, I have never yet been near the Achaean lands, nor set foot on my native country, and I have had nothing but one long series of misfortunes from the day I set out with Agamemnon for Ilus, the land of noble steeds to fight the Trojans. But tell me, and tell me true, in what way did you die? Did you have a long illness, or did heaven vouchsafe you a gentle, easy passage to eternity? Tell me also about my father and the son whom I left behind. Is my property still in their hands, or has someone else got hold of it who thinks I shall not return to claim it? Tell me again what my wife intends doing, and in what mind she is. Does she live with my son and guard my estate securely, or has she made the best match she could and married again? My mother answered, "'Your wife still remains in your house, but she is in great distress of mind and spends her whole time in tears both night and day. No one as yet has got possession of your fine property, and Telemachus still holds your lands undisturbed. He has to entirely entertain largely, as of course he must, considering his position as the magistrate, and how everyone invites him. Your father remains at his old place in the country, and never goes near the town. He has no comfortable bed nor bedding. In the winter he sleeps on the floor in front of the fire with the men, and goes about all in rags. But in summer, when the warm weather comes on again, he lies out in a vineyard on a bed of vine leaves thrown anyhow upon the ground. He grieves continually about your never having come home, and suffers more and more as he grows older. As for my own end, it was in this why. Heaven did not take me swiftly and painlessly in my own house, nor was I attacked by any illness such as those that generally wear people out and kill them, but my longing to know what you were doing and the force of my affection for you. This it was that was the death of me. And then I tried to find some way of embracing my poor mother's ghost. Thrice I sprang towards her and tried to clasp her in my arms, but each time she flitted from my embrace as it were a dream or phantom, and being touched the quick I said to her, Mother, why do you not stay still when I would embrace you? If we could throw our arms around each other, we might find sad comfort in the sharing of our sorrows, even in the house of Hades. Does Persephone want to lay on still a further load of grief upon me by mocking me with a phantom only? My son, she answered, most ill-fated of all mankind, and it is not Persephone that is beguiling you, but all people here are like this when they are dead. The sinews no longer hold the flesh and bones together. These perish in the fierceness of consuming fire as soon as life has left the body, and the soul flits away as though it were a dream. Now, however, go back to the light of day as soon as you can, and note all these things that you might tell them to your wife hereafter. Thus we did converse, and anon Persephone sent up the ghosts of the wives and daughters of all the most famous men. They gathered in crowds about the blood, and I considered how I might question them severally. In the end, I deemed it would be best to draw the keen blade that hung on my sturdy side and keep them from drinking the blood at once. So they came one after the other, and each one, as I questioned, told me about her race and lineage. So then our next story is um, Prometheus, and this translation's a little hard to understand, so I might go over it afterwards just so you understand what happened. For when the gods and mortal men had a dispute at Mekone, even then Prometheus was forward, to cut up a great ox and set portions before them, trying to be fool the mind of Zeus. Before the rest, he set flesh and inner parts thick with fat upon the hide, covering them with ox an ox paunch. But for Zeus, he put up the white bones, dressed up with cunning art and covered with shining fat. Then the father of men and gods said to him, Son of Iaptus, most glorious of all lords, good sir, how unfairly you have divided the portion. So said Zeus, whose wisdom is everlasting, rebuking him, but wily Prometheus answered him, smiling softly, and not forgetting his cunning trick. Zeus, most glorious and greatest of the eternal gods, take whichever of these portions your heart within you bids. So he said, thinking trickery, but Zeus's wisdom is everlasting, saw and failed not to perceive the trick, and in his heart he thought mischief against mortal men, which also was to be fulfilled. With both hands he took up the white fat and was angry at heart, and wrath came to his spirit when he saw the white ox bones craftily tricked out, and 
Because of this, tribes of men upon the earth burn white ox bones to the deathless gods upon fragrant altars. But Zeus, who drives the clouds, was greatly vexed and said to him, Son of Iaptus, cleverer above all, so, sir, you have not yet forgotten your cunning art. So spake Zeus in anger, whose wisdom is everlasting. And from that time he was always mindful of the trick, and would not give power to a, f a wearying fire to the Melian race of mortal men who live upon the earth. But the noble son of Iaptus outwitted him, and stole the far-seeing gleam of unwearying fire in the hollow stock fennel stock and zeus who thunders on high was stung in spirit and his dear heart was angered when he saw amongst men the far-seen ray of fire so that is the story of how sacrifice occurs and um zeus is tricked to pick a sacrifice of bones and not good parts of the animal uh when instead of picking the meat because the meat is disguised as looking like the organs of the animal and so then, of course, man is punished by taking away fire, and then Prometheus says, goes and steals the fire back, which then ends up with uh, Pandora afterwards, and that's how this wild story ends. Uh, but that's what happened in that last clip there. Okay. So in both of these stories, the characters suffer without having light in the dark times. In the case of Prometheus, it is very literal. There is no fire, and therefore there is rampant disease and starvation because they cannot make and cook food. And although there is no physical light when Odysseus talks to his mom, there is the light of seeing family and learning what has happened while he has been away in darkness, the war, for over a decade. So, many of you know my personal negative feelings toward Odysseus, but I will give it to him that he loves and cares about his family and their safety. The winter holidays are a time to gather things that bring light to you in the cold darkness, and to share your light as Prometheus does, and as Odysseus does by letting his mother know he is alive. Sharing our light is what the season is all about, and we do this by eating together, giving gifts, and spending time in the company of others. Okay. So we will now move into the ritual portion of the observance. Um, again, please, please, if you have not already, go fill out the end of the year survey. It has um, lots of information about this in there and a vote. Um, then for now, I will read the words, but this is going to change up in the new year. I've got a whole wonderful plan, so it'll be great. So we leave this offering for our gods to symbolize our connection and devotion. We gift this water to accept the flow of our lives. We gift this rock to symbolize the stability of gods in the world. We welcome life and bless our offerings with oil to share our riches. We embrace our connection to each other and the world and celebrate our revival. So we'll now do our closing words. I know this was a bit of a shorter observance, uh, but I really wanted to read you Prometheus' story, and it's a short one. Um, and also just, you know, have a general fun time. Uh, please remember, uh, we have a lot of new exciting events in the new year, including uh, some contests, and we have a New Year's party coming up, as well as our movie night, so I hope everyone really looks forward to all of those things and comes to participate with us. So, as we move out into the world, let us remember our community of faith. Cherish love and open your heart as you walk through life. Hold dear the light of the gods and our connection with the natural world. Go forth in celebration and carry the light of connection within your heart. Good evening and welcome to Sun Metal Temple. We